the third, Donald Beaver, brother of Todd Beaver, number eight, school number 18, custodial engineer. August the 15th, Deacon Erko Cook, father of Diana Cook, PS number 415 teacher. August 19, Darlene Whalen, mother-in-law of Kim Whalen, assistant to Dr. Caresses and Ro Dr. Roster. August 21st, Donald H. Hills, father of David Hill, P.S. number 208 principal. August 21, Helen Cully, mother of Laura Ann Cully, public school teacher number at number 366. September the 6th, Theodore Green, father of Desiree Stenhouse, public school number 301 clerk. September the 18th, Anna Carroll Civilian, former BPS employee and mother of Deborah Civilian Poles, retired administrator. September the 25th, June Sacru, mother of Maureen Sacru, public school number 304 teacher. October the 9th, Alicia M. Campbell, district speech ling ling language pathologist. October the 15th, J Joan Colley, mother of PS number 81, teacher Lynn McCar McCarthy. Please, a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, welcome to our board meeting today. I'm Sharon Belton Cotman. I am filling in for our president today. I will start with our board recognition and our superintendent update to follow. Uh, Aaron, do we have a board recognition this evening? No, we do not. Okay. okay. No board recognition. Superintendent update. The updates. Postponed till next Okay, postponed till next time. We've got people who are, have to get on the road this week, I guess. Okay. Comments from speakers. At this time, the board welcomes speakers who have signed up to speak at today's meeting. Please be reminded that all speakers' remarks must be limited to three minutes or less. We ask that speakers be mindful that this is a business meeting open to the public and televised locally. Attendees and viewers include persons from throughout Western New York, including children. This board asks that speakers conduct themselves professionally and that their comments remain civil and courteous, bearing in mind that they will be heard by people of all ages. This is an opportunity for Buffalo's residents to address the B Buffalo Board of Education about issues that serve the public interest and district mission, and the board asks that speakers demonstrate appropriate decorum. Thank you for joining us. The board calls Stephen Hicks, followed by Alonzo Smith. Good evening, board members. Good evening. You know, I'm Stephen Hicks. I introduced myself to you last year. I'm president of Substitutes United. We represent the substitutes of uh, Buffalo, New York, who work for the uh, Buffalo City School District. I'm just here to expound on what we started last week. Um, as you know, we have filed actions, uh, what we believe are some illegal actions in terms of extending the school day and not properly compensating substitute teachers. Uh, we filed two actions against you. But we just also want to just talk about why, why we feel that we are a significant part of the educational continuum in the city of Buffalo, uh, and it doesn't seem to uh, be recognized by, by the district. Uh, we want to expound, and we have other speakers coming up after I speak to talk about some of our uh, experiences in our system and how we do care for our young people and we care about them succeeding in their education. We are there when the, sub when the teachers are there. So we feel that we are significant people, a, a, a part of our a part of our children's growth. Uh, we walk into schools that are, some of them are in disarray. If I could be quite honest with you, some of them are outright dangerous. 
we're not safe in the schools, but yet we don't feel that we we, we significant enough to warrant compensation, extending our day. Uh, we have reason to believe that our human resources are uh, unduly terminating certain groups of people, and we'll have statistics on that next month. Uh, and we'll talk about that. We'll have we've done some studies about that. So we just want to uh, let us let you know that we are here, and we will be here every month to speak to you about the experiences of substitute teachers in the city of Buffalo and what we endure. But we are part of this education and we do care about our young people. We want to make that perfectly clear. So with that, I'd like to thank you and I look forward to our other speakers, our substitute teachers, sharing what they have to say with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Is Alonzo Smith here? Yes, ma'am. Followed by Rhonda Paul. Rona Paul. Rona Paul. Pleasure to be here. Proud to be a Buffalo substitute teacher since 1992. Uh, substitute teachers, the District Cinderellas, the G.I. Joes, the, the G.I. Janes, Monday through Friday, superheroes, first responders, special forces, that's who we are. We arrive proudly, daily, ready and prepared to do all that is required and more and for less, much less. We cover 611s, 815s, 411s, and if asked, thou 911. We cover pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, second, third, fourth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. We go all the way up to 12th grade. We do special ed, math, science, social studies, technology, home and careers, and resource teachers. We work before school because we're there early. We work during the school day efficiently. We work after school. And did I forget to mention, we work summer school, that's right. When content teachers couldn't be found or did not want the job this summer, I was at McKinley High School uh, doing biology and I feel I did a good job. We give grades, do smart boards, we proctor state exams, we give tests, we prepare tests, we grade tests, we take attendance, we chaperone school dances, we go on field trips, we nurture, we lesson plan, we dry tears, we hold hands, we understand. We do lunch duties, morning duties, hallway duties, cover CSEs, we phone home, we infinite campus, we are professionals, we hold degrees, we are FBI vetted, vetted. Hablamos Espanol, we speak Spanish, Arabic, French, etc., etc. Our current contract is antiquated, outdated, inadequate, unreasonable, and unfair. It cannot be tweaked or fixed. It is in dire need of a complete overhaul. Buffalo Substitutes United are not being paid a living wage. Buffalo Substitutes United are not being fairly financially compensated for all we do and are required to do. We're called to do 100% while receiving less than our share. We receive no sick pay, none whatsoever. We accrue no sick pay, none whatsoever. We receive no vacation pay, none whatsoever. We stand in the rain, sleet, and snow. Substitute, a facsimile or replacement that serves the same purpose as its original while maintaining integrity. That's what we do. We endure verbal abuse. We are assaulted. We sadly, we're sadly misunderstood and undervalued. We're a valuable resource. The Buffalo Public Education Body has many members. Buffalo Substitutes United are an integral part of that body. We work at 3, 45, 59, 72, 76, all the high schools. If there's a Buffalo Public School, there's a Buffalo Public Substitute School teacher at that facility working diligently. Thank you very much. Is Rhonda Paul? Rona? Yes. Sorry. Yes, it's R-O-N-A, for the record. I have been a substitute teacher for the past 14 years, every single day. I want to emphasize that as substitute teachers, we provide stability and cohesiveness. We are the bridge between the regular teacher and the student. Without a sta stable workforce of subs, there would be chaos. We need the money so that we can continue to attract educated and able people to do these jobs. They're important jobs for the educational system, for the parents, and for the students. We have many, many challenges. And some of these challenges, I would love to um, invite anyone to come into some of our rooms and not only manage the problem, but actually teach. 
because when we go in there, we teach. We do not babysit. We cover that lesson plan so that that teacher does not fall behind, so that those students don't miss one single second of learning. And as I tell those students every single day, they have six hours each and every day to change their lives. We are there to make sure that they are better, that they succeed, and with our help they will. But if we are not treated as professionals, why should they respect us if you don't respect us? We have, um, we need different challenges. We are, um, I'm just, I'm, I just want to go over that. We provide stability and cohesiveness, which is extremely important. We provide the bridge between the regular teachers, students, we fulfill a very important role, and not just for the educational system, but for the students, for the parents. We work together. We're partners in this system. A pay raise for us recognizes that we are skilled professionals. We are not just someone that you went out on the street and say, oh gee, we don't have enough teachers today. Oh sir, would you like to go and uh, go in the school? No. You make sure that we have background checks, we are fingerprinted, that we care about our children that we are there to serve, and we wish to be compensated as a professional. Thank you. Is Joan Simmons here? Following Joan is Cassandra Bancy. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Simmons. Um, before you start the clock, can I just get an update on a recommendation that was made a year ago uh, that was supposed to be, this is directed to Dr. Cash, it's supposed to be a committee formed to review the codes of conduct and codes of ethics for the school board. Oh, for the school board? Yes. Uh, that would be executive affairs. That, would be me. Yeah. that was submitted twice. Mm -hmm in the past year? Well, if we fell short in the past year, we've accomplished a lot okay. in return. We'll put that on our table, uh, okay. our well, table to move forward. There, okay. there, I'm, I'm mentioning it because um, this past year, the board, the city, the students, the teachers, um, and concerned citizens have um, been subjected to a, a a process that was um, um, very expensive, not just financially, but in terms of the community's um, uh, faith and confidence in the board to do the job for which they were elected. And I think this is a teachable moment, and I would hope that the board would see it as such, and I'm talking about the removal of Carl Palladino from the school board. Um, we certainly don't need a surrogate for Carl, and um, the reason I propose this to the superintendent because, as I understand it, part of your responsibility is to, to advise the board on policy matters. Okay, so if I've submitted it to the wrong person then I'll resubmit it. Um, I think it needs to be taken, taken a look at seriously. Um, laws and rules and regulations and policies are only as good as the measures you put in place to enforce compliance. And I would hate to see this city, this school district, go through another year, two years, dealing with issues as far as code of conduct and code of ethics is concerned. So I'm going to, you know, again, I'll resubmit that chair to you. Would you please? And I would suggest again, this is a teachable moment. Okay? It an ex was an expensive moment, a prolonged moment. So I hope you take this seriously and make sure that everybody is on the same page. Because I can tell you right now, that there was a recent incident, somebody published something in the newspaper when clearly the Code of Ethics conduct says that you have to be able to, you can only speak, well, I mean, you put a caveat saying you're speaking for yourself mm -hmm. and not the board. That's pretty simple. Not complicated. Okay. There are other issues about cooperation and compromise 
So again, I thank you for your time and I will make sure that, that, that another, hopefully another year doesn't go by that you take this opportunity to fix this. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cassandra, Nancy. Hi, good evening. For the record, it's Yancey, Y-A-N-C-E-Y. I'm sorry. Um, my last name, Yancey, Y-A-N-C-E-Y. Y-A-N-C-E-Y. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about the removal of the parent facilitators. Um, it was kind of done very abruptly and uh, without real notice. Um, I was very caught off guard. We were asked to come in for a meeting. The meeting turned into a termination. Um, I know there's been some talk on Facebook and all other types of medias that parents shouldn't be paid to do this type of job, but this would have been my first year being a parent facilitator. And since the beginning of the school year, I took on as a volunteer just to get myself set up and started to do everything that needed to be done for the department. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's been a lot of work coming from being at a school that had no prior um, work done for this position. Um, but in the midst of all of it, it's a great thing because like um, since I've started since September, I've been able to pull one or two parents every other week and they're coming, but they need to be notified. And these teachers don't have time to step out of their classrooms to call a parent for a field trip or, or just to come in to work with the kids on a project. So this is this position is very important to our schools to me. Um, it's given the parent part of education a greater look. It's providing better connections between the teachers and the parents as well. Um, I really don't think that it should have been removed. And in all honesty, I feel that maybe they should be paid a little more than what they are supposed to be paid because it's a lot of work to do, um, especially if you are doing it alone as a single uh, facilitator at your school. Um, it gives opportunities for a lot of things to come about, a lot of relationships to be built, and parents are calling back, which some people wouldn't think would happen. But um, I feel that it should be reinstated as soon as possible. It's not that it's a burden, but it's time consuming, which that time should be compensated for. Thank you. Thank you. Shirley, Shirley Seth Burgess, following a her is Amal Phil. Good evening. My name is Shirley Sapp Burgess, and I've been a substitute teacher since 1981. <laughs> Off and on. I've worked full time, long term. <laughs> and I enjoy the work. But the work has changed. It's gotten more difficult. The students are more difficult. The way we are trying to teach the students. We have students coming with all kinds of baggage. And when you have to deal with that before you can deal with teaching, it's important that the kids trust you and it's important that you let them know that you like them, that you care about them. We as substitute teachers come in and sometimes we don't have lesson plans, we don't have, they don't, we don't know who's who in the classroom, you don't know if you got a runner, you don't know if you got bad weather. You don't know until it happens. Mm -hmm. We need to be more better informed. We need to be paid better. We need a contract, a decent contract. We are not babysitters. We don't want to be considered babysitters. We want to help our children get the best education that they can get. And in order to do that, we need to be able to get to the, situa get to the schools, be paid, a decent wage so we can do substitute teaching. 
He gonna lose a lot of subs if we don't get, if they can't get paid. We gotta eat, we gotta live, and we shouldn't have to fight for five years for a contract. That's that's just a murder. I also think that the children lose when we're not there. We are needed. We are not babysitters. We are needed to come in and take that teacher's place. We need to be able to come in respected and we need to be able to come in knowing that we will have the support of administration and you as we do our jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Is Mr. Fields here? Okay. Kelly Bolden. Followed by Wendy Mistrada. Hello, my name is Kelly Bolden and I am a parent facilitator. On September 28th, we were called to the Office of Parent and Family Engagement and told that we were no longer parent facilitators. As a parent facilitator, I have assisted parents with finding shelter, household appliances, I have helped them sign up for social security, for social services to receive death benefits. I have worked with grandparents to help them keep their grandchildren out of the system. I have been present during parent-teacher conferences. I have stepped in between teacher and parent confrontations. As a parent facilitator, I have counseled kids from a parent point of view in the school. And in many cases, I have stood in for missing parents at the school functions. I have had a parent come into the parent room with black eyes and bruises all over. She could barely see. She had kept this abuse a secret and decided to reveal it in the comfort of the parent room. The job of a parent facilitator is much, much more than it was written in the parent facilitator handbook. We would do better being called family <coughs> advocates. Parents are also so very important for the success of the children we are trying to educate. We must continue to help the parents learn to help their children. You all sat down and decided that parent facilitator module, that the parent facilitator module for 2017-2018 was needed, it's still needed. I'd like to know what happens to the money that was budgeted for the parent facilitators if the program is not reinstated. How dare we say, we use this to say that parents are not important. Parents are important. This board needs to fix these issues and fix them now. Not six months from now, but right now. So many people are in need of our help, and we need to be able to help them. So please fix this problem immediately. Thank you. Wendy Mistrada, followed by Kevin Lafferty. Good evening. Um, Good evening. So I think we pretty all, much all frequently hear that one of the biggest challenges we have in the district is communication. Getting information through the city, through our families, through our schools, through the district. And uh, I'm glad that we're able to be here tonight. And I wish the entire board was here to hear what our parent facilitators have to say because there seems to be a, a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication about the roles that our um, parent facilitators play. Um, and it's really important for our board members to understand because you have been elected to serve the districts or at large. Uh, you act as part of the communication process, the eyes and the ears for the people within your district or at large, so that you can represent your district with the administration, many of whom do not live in your districts. Then you also bring the information back to your people and your groups that you represent. You get a small stipend to do this, probably not enough to cover the parking and the fuel and the cell phone charges when you get phone calls all the time, and the food when you're out and about, and a lot of the money that goes back into the schools when you support the programs in the schools and the students in the schools. So that's why I think it's so important that you understand that the parent, what the parent facilitators do in the buildings. Because within the school buildings, the parent facilitators have to be parents, guardians, something of a child in that school. They are the liaison between the school and the families. Because within the schools, most of the faculty and the staff are not of and from the community of the families in the schools that they're working with. 
So our parent facilitators are those liaisons. They're the ones that are making the phone calls. They're the ones getting the phone calls. They're the ones trying to organize parents to volunteer. You can't just ask a parent to come in if they don't know why they're coming in and sometimes they need support to, to help in the buildings. That is part of the role and you'll hear so many more tonight that our parent facilitators play. They play a very crucial role as the liaison between the schools and the families. If we really truly say and mean that we need more parent involvement, we need these liaisons that are from the community to act as the liaisons. And they receive a small stipend. And that stipend goes to help pay for parking and fuel and cell phone calls when they get them all times of the day and night, and the food and the child care. And frequently that money goes right back into the schools to support the kids' programs in the schools. So hopefully by the end of the night when you hear what the rest of the parent facilitators say and the rules they play, you'll have a clear understanding of what they do. And you'll understand that the discussion that we're having tonight is actually the wrong discussion. And the discussion that we should be having is how do we get more facilitators? How do we support the facilitators we have and increase their numbers? Because I know at 45, that one role was split among many parents so that we'd have more parents who could come in from different languages and help with the families. And we really need to be looking at that, how to support all our families. Thank you. Kevin Is he here? Okay, Mr. Samuel Rafford, followed by Duncan Kirkwood. Good evening, uh, Superintendent and Board Members. Uh, first time I talked to you this year, so. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, and, and actually that's a, a good thing. Um, things are going really well, and I've expressed that on a number of different occasions. Um, uh, we're here tonight um, because we are concerned about what's taking place with the parent facilitators. Um, let me just share in very clear terms that Dr. Rossler has talked to us about the intent of the district to really come up with a solution. So we're not doubting that. We're confident about the district's position on that. The superintendent has set up a meeting with us uh, for November 2nd to move forward, to look for that. Um, so we're confident about that process. So, um, and what we, the main thing we want to raise tonight is just a little bit of concern about how this came about. Um, you know, with so many other things going really well in terms of how we're working with parents, particularly the stuff that Dr. Mauricio is doing with community schools and the athletics piece and, uh, and, and about Chelly. There's just a lot of good examples on how to partner with parents and do things in a proactive way. So this felt real reactive. You know what I'm saying? You know, it felt like, you know, we had a plan. You know, we got past the budget, we had a plan, parents were interviewed, they were orientated, they signed a contract, and we were going forward with this. Then all of a sudden, on this particular date, we y'all not we not doing it. It was no nothing given to nobody in writing. No, it was just an explanation. It wasn't clear for everybody what was going on. And so, you know, obviously when you have a plan for something and you plan for it for the year, like all these other areas I'm talking about, when you stop doing it, you should have a plan on what you're replacing it with. Because other because you the plan was to achieve a goal. So if you take the people out of the way who are out of the place to achieve the goal, how are you going to achieve that goal? What's the new plan? We wouldn't talk to you about none of that stuff. You know what I'm saying? So our concern is that there are also implications. I, I won't, I'll wait till we meet with Dr. Cash to talk about that. But when we read the IRS letter, it seemed like there are implications. If the district has have to recognize the parents for the last three years as employees, it seemed like parents are, their implications to parents. That means for the last three years, you know, where they was getting 1099s, they should have got W-2s and, you know, there are other implications that should have been explained to them about the impact of what was going on. None of those kinds of things happened. And so what we don't want to do go back to the old days where we did the knee jerk stuff and just stuff happened to parents. These are parents who are the most vulnerable. You talk about parents who get paid $300 a month that may make a difference and all of a sudden in the middle of the process you're saying okay that's not happening after they kind of planned for it. They got tired you know. So it's just, we just hopeful that we will stay on the track that we've been on in terms of working well with parents and partnering with parents, if we don't backtrack to the days of stuff happening to parents as, a, as, as opposed to happening with parents. So we encourage, we are encouraged by the, that possibility. Um, and we want things to continue to go that way. And we, 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 we look forward to a good outcome on November 2nd. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> 
following Mr. Kirkwood Alanda Gethers. Uh, good evening, board members. Good evening, uh, Mr. Superintendent, Dr. Cash. Uh, so first, thank you for the opportunity to address you all. I'm here to talk about the parent facilitators. Uh, I've been chosen to be one of the DPCC's public advocates, uh, so to speak up on behalf of parents. And so, you know, as we've been talking with our parent facilitators, you know, I've actually got to learn a lot more about what they do than I originally thought as well. You know, I just kind of thought they were like the parents, they make phone calls, they, you know, kind of help other parents to get involved. But what I've learned from, you know, talking to them is that they do so much more. Uh, so for low-income parents, oftentimes, when they come to a school, they are intimidated by the process. Now, we have some great schools who have warm, receptive staffs and secretaries and administration, and we have some schools where they're cold, okay? And when parents come in, they feel like they're not welcome there. They're, they're not greeted with a smile and a, how are you doing today? The parent facilitators feel that role. They help the parents to navigate the school. They sometimes interject, so there isn't a, a, a parent at school cursing out a principal. They can tell the, the parent, this is how you get this done. This is where you go get this service. And so these are the type of things that the parent facilitators do. You know, I, I thought about the stipend. Everybody's kind of wrapped around this idea of they shouldn't be paid, they should just be volunteering. And I just totally reject that idea that if you're giving some of these parent facilitators 10, 20 hours a week, right, at the minimum, if they had a, if, they, if this was a full-time job, we'd reimburse them for mileage. At an absolute minimum, we'd reimburse them for mileage and food, right? And so, you know, this stipend is, is just to really formalize the role. Some of our parent facilitators don't even take the money. They actually invest the stipend in the PTAs at the school just so the school can have <coughs> money to operate so they can buy decorations. So, uh, as Mr. Rad, Brother Raffer said, you know, we're confident that Dr. Cash is, is, is going to provide great leadership here and get us to a resolution. I spoke with Board Member Woods that, you know, there's a, the, the focus is there, the optimism is there to find a solution. Uh, we just know that you also have 50 other things that you've got to find solutions for, that you've got to work through. And we just want this issue to be on the forefront you know, your minds are on your desks because for a lot of our parents, they're on pins and needles operating in this gray area and they don't know what's next or what's coming. So we would just, uh, we'd like, like Sam said, we're optimistic about the next meeting that we're going to have and uh, we hope that we can all kind of work through this together as a learning experience and make a stronger partnership between parents and the board and the uh, central office administration. So thank you all. Have a blessed evening. Is Amanda Brothers here? Okay. Is Mr. Keith Jones here? Yes, he is. Good evening, board. Dr. Cash. Good evening. Good evening. Audience, uh, you know, I put down one to speak about facilitators, which I do because that is an important role that they play. As you know, most of y'all know I was one and will be open. I undergo under the title as investors. But yeah, facilitators do a lot of things that's very valuable, that helps out as a buffer in the school building. A lot of kids look forward to seeing that little greeting in the morning or say hi to them, go in the lunchroom, pat them on the back, something like that. It perks them up and helps the teachers too. But my main thing tonight is something that came to my attention is fifth grade social studies, what our children are being taught as far as history, but it's a history. You know, that was brought to my attention. I looked in the book that we come over here like we was in the luxury ship seeing Ellis Island and things of that nature. And you shouldn't start teaching kids false history since there's a statement out there now called fake news, fake history. We did not come over here through Ellis Island. We did not come over here on our own free will. We were snatched out of it. We have kings and queens that we come from that these kids will never know about. So how are you going to be proceeding in a positive light and you don't know where you come from? There's too much fake history going. First, I can start back when a lot of people don't know who was the first person killed the American Revolution. Christmas Addicts. A black man. 
A lot of people believe that Christopher Columbus came and discovered America, which is false, because he looked at indigenous people in their face. But we're not teaching our children that. Everybody's history is going that you know if you come from England, you know this Queen of England. If you come from everywhere else, you know that. One thing about it, one thing that's not fake is that when we talk about the Holocaust, that's there. But when we come to slavery, it's always something about, okay, here go the black folks, they mad about something else. We're not mad about nothing. We just want the truth to be taught to our children. Right now, everybody's mad over here about this here, about the national anthem. If you look, notice, they never say the third stanza. We still about slavery and death. And when, the, and when you go to the service, you don't say that you're going to defend the flag or the national anthem. You say you're going to defend the Constitution. Right. So let's quit doing all this here fake stuff. And teaching kids the wrong idea. Keep listening to everything that's going around now because they're trying to take it back to them days. But there's certain people that's not going to stand for that. We're going to stand up and do something about it. One day you have chicken, one day you have feathers. The day you're going to get both of them. So this is not a suit. This is not nothing there. Some of you people don't understand where that's at. But a lot of you people think the Confederate flag was something that was thrown in. And y'all represent, y'all want to say General Lee and all this. These were people that was going against America. Teach that. Just quick, get off this other, and I'll see, to be continued. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Dorothy J. Gray, and following her is the Reverend Dan Schiffling. Is Dorothy J. Gray here? I'm right here. I'm right here. Oh, Dorothy. Hi, how are you? Hi to everybody tonight. Everybody knows me. Um, I don't need an introduction. I am the longest parent facilitator there is in the district. My record speaks for itself. I uh, bond, I form relationships, I have taught other parent facilitators. We are needed in the buildings. Um, I was at MLK for 13 years. I've been at school 89, this is my second year. It's been such a big change at school 89. Uh, Ms. Cotton has come over there. She's seen the pair room. She's seen things that we are doing. We are very much needed. The money that I received, I worked for five years, didn't get a dime. I was on the committee when we voted for parent facilitators. It's been going well for us. You're not paying us to come in and see about our children, because I'm there for my children. I'm there for the parents to help their children to see. My parent room is set up with uh, materials and whatever a parent needs, clothing, whatever. It's, it's available for them. No one gives me money for coffee, uh, uh, tablecloths, food, for meetings. I'm at every meeting. I, anytime I'm called to interview principals, assistant principals, BOCES, whatever, I have always been at everything. So I'm just going to ask you guys to please think about the parent facilitators and reinstate us, please. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Reverend Dan Schiffling. <laughs> How are you? Good. I'm Reverend Dan Schiffling. Uh, I'm the chair of the advisory committee for the Buffalo Peacemakers Youth Violence and Gang Intervention Program. And um, I'm happy to have a couple of minutes to begin speaking to you about the Safe Passage program that the Buffalo Peacemakers operate each and every school day. This is a program that the Peacemakers have done for the last four years. Um, it's grown over time to be much more sophisticated. There are hundreds and hundreds of kids, young people, that uh, mix with each other on their way home from school every school day. They come from different schools, different neighborhoods. They come from different gang territories. Mm -hmm. Depending on what's happened at school that particular day or what's um, happened on Facebook or what um, rumor is going around in school, <coughs> there may be some students who come out of school with the idea that they're going to settle score with someone. And there are other students that are coming out of school very afraid 
to make that passage home. The peacemakers actually cover territory from the Maine and Utica uh, station, the subway station, all the way down to Maine and LaSalle. They're on Kensington and Fillmore. They're East Delavan and Grider, and they go all the way over to East Delavan and Fillmore and all the way over to Bailey then. They're on the west side at Ontario and Tonawanda, and they go down to Ontario and Skillen. They take a position up at Fillmore and Northampton to get the students coming out of East High School. And there are two vans that rove that whole territory. They're equipped with radios. They can call in reinforcements <coughs> if they need to. What I can tell you is that there are very few fights that actually erupt on the way home because the peacemakers are doing their job of creating safety and preventing violence. They enable youth to get safely home. If a fight begins, they are able to break it up and stop it almost immediately in almost every uh, situation. They save many, many kids from being arrested. And there's a cost to that arrest, of course, to the city, to the police department to adjudicate it. But there's a cost to the kid in terms of developing a record, in terms of perhaps uh, being incarcerated or otherwise detained. Um, and there's a problem. Is anyone out of time? What, what I, uh, ten seconds. Ten seconds. But what I need to say is this program costs us about $75,000 a year. Mayor Brown has put up $35,000. Has asked the school, the public school, to match that with another thirty-five, dollars And that's actually a rather small amount of money given the other issues that you're facing. And that's what we're hoping that you'll take seriously this year. It didn't happen last year. It happened from Mayor Brown, but not from the, Buff from the Buffalo Public Schools. We are hoping this year we can um, get that support from you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Ann Coles Rivera? Yeah. Right here. Okay. Cheryl Ritman Brown? Rutland, is it? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Rutland. Hello, how are you? Thank you to the board for allowing me to speak on behalf of Parent Facilitator. I'm also a Peacemaker Buffalo Fathers. Uh, I'm here because I, ha I, I took the job as a Parent Facilitator in the beginning because I am a parent of a homicide victim. So I have a passion on identifying children and family affected by homicide. And since I've been a parent facilitator, we've identified at School 61, what well, I have as a parent facilitator, have identified 13 families that has been affected by homicide in the Buffalo Public School System. So in saying that, I've linked those families to different programs and different workshops through um, having training as a facilitator to those workshops because I'm a parent facilitator. So it's definitely a need for us to be in a Buffalo Public School system. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the work you do in our community. Thank you. Samuel Herbert, followed by Michelle Bigger. Good evening to the board member. Good evening to Superintendent Dr. Cash. I'm Samuel A. Herbert, and I'm here for a follow-up. The last time I spoke to the board in September 20th, I brought to the board's attention that it was brought to my attention that X amount of buses, cameras was not working. Um, Dr. Cash. Asked Mr. Kevin Eppley to look into it. I just received information um, from Mr. Eppley just now in regards to 
camera is working on the Buffalo school buses. He gave me a lot of information. Perhaps none of your board members knew or the community knew that there are 638 routes, five city locations, 737 buses. As of June, there were 670 plus. The contract requires 10% spare buses. The first schedule, CSD buses each have, and I was surprised, have four cameras on each bus. A total of 2,948 cameras for 737 buses. I was amazed by that number. I also, information was shared to me that there's a 1% failure rate. Of the 700 plus buses, we have identified less than 30 with hard drives not locked and less than 10 that had no power, all of which are spare SS fleets. Of those, eight have been repaired today and the remaining two out of service awaiting wiring harnesses. Another measure of the system reliability this school year is the actual request for video clips. As a matter of normal practice, we are requested by the BCSD to pull videos from buses, monitoring evaluations, incidents on buses and collisions. In a formal phone survey, five location managers and safety managers indicated we had approximately 49 requests for clips in the last two weeks. This information that was given to me enlightened me, and I hope it enlightened each board member, and also you, Dr. Cash, and the community. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you, Mr. Herger. Oh, one other thing, Dr. Cash, I gave you an invitation to appear on the radio. You have an open invitation. My show is next Wednesday. <laughs> um, I'm going to drop a little live plug, inviting you again publicly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Bigger, followed by Elaine Marcel. Good evening. My name is Michelle Baker, and my son William attends kindergarten at Olmstead 64. And I'm here tonight to advocate for the students and teachers at Olmstead, and quite frankly, any other Buffalo Public School who have no teacher aides in their kindergarten classes. Twenty-something kindergartners in the class with no teacher aid support whatsoever is unacceptable. It's unreasonable, and it's unjust. I am an educator myself. And I understand what it takes to create and manage a classroom that is conducive to learning. And anyone who thinks it's okay to have a class full of four and five year olds with one teacher and no additional adults as support has never spent a day or an hour in a kindergarten classroom. Students at this age are our most needy simply because everything is new. Their stamina is short and they're not yet independent learners, nor should they be. Kindergarten teachers are miracle workers and they set the foundation for students and they, they teach what many in the upper grades take for granted that kids already know. So please allow me to paint a picture for you. These are children four and five years old who come in not knowing how to sit crisscross applesauce spoons in your bowl. Most don't know how to tie or zip. They don't know how to open their milk or their snacks. They don't know how to eat in 30 minutes. They don't know how to walk in a line yet. They're learning how to cut. They're learning how to glue, how to hold a pencil, how to color. They're learning how to make friends. Not to mention, they're learning their numbers and their number literacy. Letter names, letter sounds, letter formation, phonemic awareness, they are learning how to read. Students at all ages benefit from small group instruction, but this developmental stage, small group instruction is a necessity in order to succeed. 
It's nearly impossible to meet with small groups and expect 20 some other children to work quietly and efficiently without additional support. It happens, but it takes time and practice. And the expectations that are being put on teachers without giving them any support is not only unacceptable, but it's wrong. The administration of School 64 needs to allocate funds to ensure that this happens at Olmstead and district-wide, that there are kindergarten aides in the classroom. And I urge the board to please follow up and do this. The tagline for our school district is Buffalo Public Schools putting children and families first to ensure high academic achievement for all. This is a great place to start. Let's please start doing this today. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity um, for having me speak today. My name is Elaine Barthel, and I've been a substitute teacher in uh, the Buffalo School District for the last five years, and I'd like to address my concerns. I want to first take a moment to express my appreciation uh, to the few schools in the district uh, who appreciate my work and treat me with respect as a professional when I enter the building. On the other hand, there are schools who have yet to show the same respect uh, at these times. A number of times I have been told to go to a room that I've not been assigned and this without, without a please or thank you. And then on the same day, the schedule to have changed a number of times without warning. Well, I remain flexible in these circumstances, but I appreciate, do appreciate what I'm being asked and uh, would like to know where I'm going. It offers a better consistency, not only for the teachers, but for the students. When I enter a classroom, I go in as the student's teacher for that day. And um, I give it all my all, as many of us have done. So, also, other substitute teachers, including myself, who have long-term assignments, spend hours planning and staying after school to prepare. So uh, some of these students, or some of these two teachers, excuse me, have been asked to do grades. Um, the grades for the report card, which I believe is not under compliance. I would like to, um, you to imagine a day without substitute teachers, especially in the Buffalo School District, where the need is quite high. With these concerns in mind, we as a unified substitute teachers union are requesting that the terms of negotiation of our contract be met. We are merely asking for a small increase in salary, a payment for time extension at the schools, and a very slight bonus increase. We are not even asking for an extra payment for long-term assignments, which had been taken from us years ago. What we are asking for is minimal. Also important is the courtesy to have board members be on time without cancellation for meetings with the Substitute United uh, Buffalo Union President and delegates to discuss contract negotiations. All these concerns are not only for ourselves, but for the students and teachers in the Buffalo School District. Thank you. Thank you. Leonard Pleasant, followed by Leonard Lane. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, recently, I'd like to read an excerpt from uh, former President Obama, who stated that there are some aspects of life that are tried and true gold standards, unchanged no matter the times, no matter the culture. These essential principles of how we treat one another with consideration, respect, and honesty. This being said, as a substitute teacher, the schools are now lacking consideration and respect and honesty. And I'm just asking that we, as a board and United States, United Substitutes, that we could come together with some type of plan 
to alleviate some of these issues that we do have in school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Leonard Lane, followed by Murray O. Oh. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Cash, the board. Um, Leonard Lane, president of the uh, Buffalo <coughs> Fathers, also the sit on the board of Buffalo Peacemakers. To all of the board members, most of you know me. And um, I, I am just want to say that um, we represent our children within our community for the last 17 years. Also retired Buffalo firefighter. Um, black means that um, most of the times the funerals that I go to, this is what I wear. We represent at the funeral. This means death when you look at it. So many of our children are dying in the streets, in the community, and in our schools. Right now, there are about 55 gangs in the city of Buffalo. And um, there are pretty much 700 active members, and they are growing. As we sit here and we speak, they are growing. And if we don't continue to do the work that we have to do, there's going to be many children that are dying in the streets from not only in our, you know, happening within the streets in their homes and our families, but are in our schools. They're getting young as 13. We're already up to 35 homicides in the city of Buffalo, and they are growing. The peacemakers are a plus within our community and our neighborhood. We are blanket across the city. And the only reason why we haven't grown as much as we is because most of the families haven't realized that the next child could be theirs. We have grandchildren that goes to these schools. I think we have, you know, your children that goes to these schools, and we are the mediator for them children in the city of Buffalo. When the cops need, when the Buffalo police need help, they're the ones we call. When the mayor needs help, they're the one we call. When you guys need help, we are the one we call. Now, the board have made some promises to us, and we're not going to really go into that because of the time. But the fact, I'm hoping that you fulfill the promises that you have made on us, made to us as peacemakers. Now, uh, the mayor, mayor Byron Brown, mayor Byron Brown, seeing that it was fit that we that we get the monies that we need to to complete the services that we need. But now it's up to the board to make that decision. So the phone calls won't be coming into your home to talk about their child or their children have been lost because there are no peacemakers, makers of peace. Um, in the community in the city now we cover from from Maine and Amherst to Kensington and Bailey and all of the outskirts and all of from first Buffalo to Juneteenth to the Italian festival to anywhere that they feel that you And I want to say you are that people are afraid to walk in we are the ones that go in that stands in between the Buffalo police and the people and if no one's there then there's gonna be a lot of our children that's gonna be slain in the streets you know, not only this year, but the years is coming. So I'm asking you, um, we need the monies to help these Buffalo peacemakers, which is really no money. Most of them are volunteers, which I'm a volunteer for the last 17 years in the school. I volunteer my time because of the fact I was affected by gang violence and by homicides. And so I say it's my day today, and it will be your day tomorrow. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Followed by Tracy Mullen. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here as a Buffalo peacemaker and a um, Chairman of Stop the Violence Coalition, and I'm going to talk about safe passage right off the top. As you look into your audience, you have about seven kids that go to the MST. Now, they're here to do a project, right? We took up their seats, so I use my intelligence to give up our seats for Buffalo Peacemakers so they can come here to get the assignment that they need to carry on in the Buffalo Public Schools. As a peacemaker, these are the roles that we play. We are out on the streets every day. Some of these young kids in here right now were kids three years ago that was raising havoc on the corner. I mean, going off from the stores, fighting every day. But right now, they're here getting education, and it's about Buffalo Peacemakers helping them. And you guys need to understand that. You know all about our work, and yet still we here fight for funding. Why? Why are we here? 
Dr. Cash, I'm quite sure your constituents are giving you the right information. Therefore, we need to be moving forward with yes. this. You see these yellow shirts out here every day in this city fighting for safe passage. Now, I can give you some incidences of when kids are getting on metro buses, right? NFTA is not here. Well, we actually get on the bus and tell the kids to move back a little bit more so they can have safe passage home. This is not just black kids. These are Muslim kids. These are African kids. These are Somalian kids. We are all over the city of Buffalo from all the way out there to Ontario on Skilling. Yes. Come on now. It's just hard. We go and help out everybody. But when it comes to this board, when you guys were having your fights, we had your back. When are you going to have our back? I say it again. When are you going to have our backs? When you had a crisis at MST, Ms. Cotman, with a young lady and a young man killed in a car, and it wasn't even about violence. They just died with gangs were there. We came in there when your crisis service team couldn't do the job. We came in there and talked to the kids and got them to say we're not going to tear up the school. This is what Buffalo Police Nations do in the city of Buffalo. And if you think I'm joking, try riding by us sometime. Don't just ride by us and just wave at us. Yeah. Stop your cars and get out and help us. Yeah. This is the work that we need from Buffalo Peace Makers from this board. This board has to come out this room and see the work that we're doing. We do this honestly and from our hearts. Trust me, we like the work that you guys are doing right now. But it's time for y'all to step up. You get big money and you just holding on to it. Programs are going out the door. Why? These kids out here are noticing this. They are the future. You are not the future. They are the future and Buffalo Peacemakers will not leave them out there stranded. God bless you and God bless Buffalo. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Tracy Mullen. She's here. Yes, her. uh, sorry we don't have substitutes, Mr. Uh, Johnson. Uh, Daniel Green. Followed by Akua Kamal Harris. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, Dr. Cash. Um, I appreciate being able to speak today. Um, this is my second meeting. Um, it's very eye opening. Um, I live in Allentown. Um, but I do like to travel all around Buffalo, and this is uh, a great opportunity to see how the Buffalo public school system is run and to also voice um, any concerns that we have. Uh, my concern is the teacher to student ratio across kindergartens, uh, all the kindergarten classrooms in the public, bu public schools. Um, I was told last year that <coughs> the student to teacher ratio uh, was 14 to 1. Uh, students, 28 students uh, with one teacher, one full-time aide. Um, with the aides being removed this year from the classroom, um, the class size went down a little bit, but it is still effectively a ratio of 25 students to one professional teacher in the classroom. Um, like Michelle was saying, this is pretty unacceptable. Uh, it is very hard for a teacher to um, do his or her work um, and focus on um, individualized students, uh, students who might need a little bit more attention. Um, those kids might just fall through the cracks. Um, I, our, our teacher, the teacher for my daughter's classroom is wonderful. Um, she has reached out to parents for help and luckily the parents have stepped up. Um, we have at least one or two parents in the classroom every day but that can't happen all the time. Um, I've volunteered for a couple classrooms and I can tell you that or a couple of days and I can tell you that I can see the stress in the teacher's face and that stress translates to the children. Um, so I just want to leave you guys thinking um, if there were 25 kids here and we all had to focus on just one of them at one time, um, how hard that would be. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Akua? Good evening. It's Good a evening. pleasure to see all of you. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate all the hard work that you all do every day on behalf of parents and children to make 
make sure that our children are getting the best education. But I'm here to speak about an issue that no one should be here speaking about. When the board, when the board finally removed Carl Palladino from this board, I thought the spirit of backstabbing, throat slashing, I thought it was over. But then you all turn around and do some of the very things you used to cry out to this community about that was being done to you and do it to the peer facilitators without any warning whatsoever. And it is so unfair. It's unfair to parents and it's unfair to children. You know what the educational mantra is for the system. I won't even repeat that because it should be in your memory like it's in ours. When I went to the DPC meeting, I was surprised at what they told me how you handled these parent facilitators and told them they didn't have a they they didn't have a place in the school system anymore. And yet they have boldly continued to do what they do on behalf of the children and parents because they care. Not for $300 a month. I know how much money this board throws away and waste on nothingness and get very little of it back. When you're finally spending money, where you're getting a fair return for every dollar, you just carelessly kick these people aside like they're nothing. And it's not right. It's ungodly and it's uncivilized. And I expected more of this board. I really, really did. My heart is broken because some of you I voted for, some of you I worked on your campaigns for, and I don't understand it. I really don't. And I hope you find no good rest at night to sleep in. These parent facilitators work very hard. They do. I mean, for years you've been saying, Parents aren't interested in the kids' education. The children are this, the children are that. As soon as you have a place and a station and people in place who want to help change that, who want to get parents interested in the partnership they should have with the school and with the education of their children, you keep these people aside. You should be ashamed. You really should be. Jessica Bauer, Sherry Burns, and finally, <laughs> Camille Phil. Good evening, board members and Dr. Cash. My name is Jessica Bauer-Walker. I'm a parent and the PTO president at International School 45, and I'm also the director of the Community Health Worker Network of Buffalo. I was here last month with uh, several parents, students, and experts on public health and education talking about a whole child approach. I'm here to reiterate that tonight and also to focus on the need to build a foundation of support and empowerment for parents, students, and community members. We're hearing many people tonight talking about these types of approaches, using community members to prevent and mitigate violence, restorative practices, parent leaders in buildings to support parent involvement, ensuring that our smallest children are safe and supported. There's a lot of good going on in our schools right now. There's a lot of positive initiatives. We need to make sure that there's a strong foundation so that these initiatives are sustainable. I would suggest that we explore a back to basics approach. Sometimes we deal with a lot of complexity in what we're doing and then we come up with complex solutions. But maybe the the solution here is not more complexity, it's actually simplicity. And maybe we need to be responding more than reacting. Um, preventing problems before they happen in the first place. I think sometimes it's hard to see the impact of folks like peacemakers and parent facilitators because they're preventing problems from happening in the first place. They are the people that we continuously go to and ask for help when there are crisis situations. They're on the ground every single day. Um, as a parent at International School 45 and the very diverse population we serve, I have trained and worked with parent facilitators who come from all different languages and backgrounds and it has been a huge blow to our school community to not have those folks on the ground. 
We have gotten outside funding and we have trained parent facilitators as community health workers so that they're better mobilized to be able to serve the needs of their parents. Many of the parent facilitators that are speaking tonight are cross-trained as community health workers. We have done research on the efficacy of this model. Parent facilitators need more support, not less. We should have full-time parent facilitators in every building. We should be looking at a model that builds them up even more, especially when most of our staff and administrators don't come from our community. We need folks in the community. We need folks on the ground in the buildings who are making these connections and who are building these bridges. And so I really urge you to think about how we can have an approach here that builds a strong foundation so our community schools can be successful, so that we can use things like restorative practices and restorative justice, so we can prevent problems from happening in the first place. Let's use the policies that we have in place. Let's implement things like the wellness policy, which give us a great framework. We need a director of health-related services. That position has been vacant for five months since Sue Ventresca left. We need key staff people who are on the ground helping to connect the dots and connect with the community. So please reconsider how we can support community supports like peacemakers and build bridges with our parent facilitators and support parent leadership so that our schools can be strong, we have a good foundation, and we can all work in collaboration. Thank you. And then Mr. Kamal Phil. My name is Sherry Burns. <clears throat> I'm a resident of North Buffalo, a mom. And tonight I'm here to represent Citizen Action. And I want to open with a quote that is very much in my mind right now. I've got a lot going on this week, but y'all are important enough, I came out anyway. You're an old <laughs> hippie, you may know this song. Time is too slow for those who wait, and time is too swift for those who fear. We more or less together are working on a vision <coughs> of a just system for children, especially of color and those with disabilities where anyone will be happy to send their child up to and past the fifth grade. There are specific things that I am looking for and that Citizen Action has been in conversation with members of the staff and the district about for quite a while now and I would like to make sure the board is aware of those. We are waiting to hear the results of a cross check of student absenteeism and student suspension. Because if we are talking about changing a culture of our schools and we do not connect those dots, we can spend all the money in the world over here on attendance and we're throwing them out the door with a whole other message over here called school to prison pipeline. So we're waiting, we're waiting. We really want to see a, something impaneled for a case review. Because we are not interested in did we suspend them by the book? This is not our compliance issue. This is our children's lives. We want to be able to look at cases and go, could we have done differently or better, sooner, more, so that we never brought this child to the point that they were being thrown out of school for whatever reason. Culturally relevant training and professional development as well as code of conduct training at all staff levels. And I know this is being worked on and I recognize and applaud the board for this, but it also needs to include fairly compensated parent facilitators and substitute teachers. We want to congratulate, and, oh, and one more, and for parents and for community engagement. Community. And on that, kudos to Larry over here and the Buffalo Parent Teacher Organization. This Saturday, 9 to 11 at East High School, 820 Northampton, 14211. Two hours on restorative practices. If you don't know what this is about or it's new or you're not sure how it's done, please make yourself available and go if you can. It will be a great presentation. Kudos to the Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition, to the peacemakers, to stop the violence. Plans are important. Data is important. Results are the most important thing. Ending the suspension disparity that falls so damagingly on children whose best hope is tied to successful education. All our city's children are in our care. We can and must do more, do better together. Children only grow up once. We welcome collaboration and meeting with the board members, Dr. Cash, and staff to further this work. 
Thank you, Mr. Mr. Fields. Uh, blessed love, thank you very much for uh, letting me speak. I apologize for being late. Transportation is sometimes difficult in getting through those metal detectors. Sometimes it's difficult. Putting students and families first to ensure high academic achievement for all, all means district school students, charter school students, home school students, and adult learners. Uh, we have to emphasize the value of education, and the value of education is better emphasized when the truth is being taught. We are still being taught a lot of misinformation or miseducation, or basically lies. I watched the Common Council hearing when they talked about uh, Christopher Columbus, <coughs> and now we're about to go into Thanksgiving. And uh, I listened to a lot of people's conversations, and they talk about history, and they talk about uh, slaves rather than enslaved people. They talk about masters rather than enslavers. Uh, there, there's a language of oppression that has gone along with the oppression that has gone along that has developed in this country, and a lot of us speak that language without even really considering it. Um, I watched the last couple of meetings, and I watched how members want to silence other people from talking, or want people to control their tongues and not being called not to not be called names. I think it's by one's actions that people will be known, not by the names they're called. Uh, there was a, I heard a wise person say that I, don't, I never let my schooling get in the way of my education. And there's a lot of schooling going on here, but I don't know how much education. And education is a lifelong process. We should make education so welcoming to students that they want to, they want to, they want to learn. The only thing we should be teaching students is how to find the answers to the questions they have in life teach them that kind of thing. Uh, I support parent facilitators, I support the subs, I support the new education bargain for the super, that the superintendent has laid out. But a bargain is a two-way thing. It's a two-way street. And working together truly does work. I'm concerned about the video playback that's happening. I'm still waiting to see the video playback of the August meeting where you had a one-hour protest going on. I haven't seen that yet. Um, and I think we really need a full-time board. And if not a full-time board, you all need assistance to help you with all the paperwork, dedicated assistance to help you with the paperwork and the big job that you have. It's a very big job you have and a very important job. And I think working together truly does work. I'm curious about what's happening with the Office of Civil Rights whether there is any sort of compliance with it. You hired professionals to give you advice. You chose not to take that advice. Things got worse. And now you're asking the community to tell you what should happen. What happened to the advice that the professionals gave you? Um, working together truly does work. And I hope that we can all work together. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us. It's a big job, but we can do it if we work together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fields. Speakers from our superintendent. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Looks like I see some students in the audience. If there are students in the audience, could you please stand, please, so we can recognize you if you're students? Great, thank you. <laughs> Any particular Thing that brings you here that we could know about? Is it a class assignment? Uh, what, what, what brings you to our meeting tonight in such a large number? Yes, sir. Stand up, please. So you're going to take notes and go back to class and do what? Write an essay about what you observed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to speak from the students? What right. school? Thank you. What school is it? MST. MST. All right. All right. Thank you. And what teacher has to do in that? What did you teach? Thank you very much. Thank yes. you, students. Yes, young man. Okay, very good. Great, welcome. Thank you. It seems like there's about four groups, maybe, of speakers tonight. Let me make a statement about each. Um, 
I want to thank you, subs, for your presence here this evening. Certainly, I, as superintendent, greatly value our substitutes. Uh, I do believe that we need to have new codicils in this contract and uh, have directed staff to ensure that they are in there to upgrade the professional uh, aspects of, of being a substitute in our school district. So those are in there. We're negotiating those with you. I don't think we're that far apart, and I think that we will uh, resolve our uh, substitute teacher contract uh, in the near future. Certainly it is a goal of mine. Thank you for being here. On the issue of parent facilitators, again, appreciate all of you coming here tonight. I think the gist of their concern tonight lies over the way apparently you were communicated about the sudden uh, ceasing of payment or having parent facilitators at all. So if that was communicated in, in a way that was hurtful, disrespectful, untimely, whatever those uh, adjectives were that you used. And I apologize on behalf of my staff and on behalf of the district for that. Uh, I have uh, set a meeting uh, with leaders of the uh, parent groups, namely the Parent Congress, to talk about this issue and see if there can be some, uh, some resolve or some way forward to continue to have very active parent role in the schools. I don't know what that answer may be. Uh, I'm not going to make any promises about it. The issue is a complex one. I'm not sure all of you that spoke tonight understand fully uh, the complications around this particular issue. But what I will say is that I'm open-minded to hearing and having a dialogue with you about uh, what we might do uh, in, this in this regard, make it a win-win situation. But I also want to say that, uh, as I often tell Sam, organizations move at the speed of trust, uh, and trust is a two-way street. I got to be able to trust that uh, we can, when we, if we can organize and mobilize so quickly uh, to come on an issue like this, uh, we should also be able to organize and mobilize quickly when we need to uh, attend events, when we need to get our students to school, get our students to work uh, harder than too many of them are, and get their behavior to, to straighten out. There really shouldn't be so many peacemakers and so many uh, other issues that have to address with a behavior in a school district. This is a big, small city, but pound for pound, <coughs> we spend an awful lot of time on student behavior. And to me, that is something that starts in the home with parents. You're the first teacher, you, dis you discipline your children. I don't want to have to do it. Because if I do it, I'm going to do it disproportionately. And disproportionality is an issue in my district. So get together with me in this next conversation. We're not going to just talk about payment. We're going to talk about this new education bargain. And what your obligations are as a parent, first and foremost. And how you can do that job even better. <clears throat> we got our responsibilities and you got your responsibilities. And so we're going to talk about that too. Now, the next issue is these peacemakers, okay? And once again, uh, it shouldn't be all about money. We can give you 35000 but I want to have another conversation. I want to expand the conversation beyond this uh, money thing. I want to talk about presence. I want to talk about when, what, how, and uh, I want to have a conversation with you as well. So we're going to have a meeting soon <coughs> with me uh, and the peacemakers. Okay, because we need to be have a two-way dialogue uh, about all of that. Well, it is true that the issue is there, but the issue hasn't slowed down. So where's the intervention? Where's the prevention? Where's the reduction of the issues that we face daily uh, in this school system? I'm still dealing with attendance issues. I'm still dealing with suspension issues. I'm still dealing with behavior and violent crime inside and around our schools on a daily basis on a daily basis. I want to have a meeting with you, uh, peacemakers, coming soon. The next thing that I saw and heard was around uh, uh, fake history and issues around history. Uh, no big disagreement there. That's been going on since history. 
his story has been told. What we've been trying to do with our culturally and linguistic uh, curriculum and our Amistad curriculum is to start to inject and infuse a greater conversation from, with, among more people and tell their stories, have their journey told. Uh, Bell Hooks, one of my favorite writers, says that a people resist best when they tell their story. So we're giving a lot of opportunities on our, through our community schools, through our uh, narratives, to, for people to be able to tell their stories and to get this out and get the truth told from the various folks' perspective. Truth is a relative issue, too. It's, it's the truth of the people speaking it. So everybody needs to be in the conversation, and I'm a full supporter of that in this curriculum. So to uh, suggest that we're still doing the same old things, I want to hear about that and, and try to correct it when we, whenever we can. We've upgraded many of our curriculum texts and our materials. And as I understand, Ms. Botticelli, those are in line with a more uh, accurate uh, telling of history in our text. I want to thank Sam Heber Herbert because even though it didn't sound like it, uh, I think he was complimenting the district. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was saying that he appreciated the update of the information and that in fact Mr. Eberly had uh, right away uh, gotten an email out about that that was full and detailed, sent it to the board. I believe the board did receive a copy mm -hmm. of that email. And then Mr. Herbert, if he just got it, he should have gotten it before. He did. When did he get it? I had talked to him verbally. I gave him the hard copy email. We were just doing emails the last few days. Okay, so. We had talked about it. All right, so I appreciate him sort of correcting the record, if you will, and uh, educating the public around, around this issue of bus cameras. Thank you for that. Um, I think that there's an issue continuing to linger at Olmstead Elementary School around uh, adequacy of, of aids and assistance in a, in a kindergarten classroom. Uh, it seems to be continuing on that. I've asked Ann and the, um, I think it's Ms. Brady colleagues, that that's her school, to, to look into that and make sure that when they're, do we have a plan for at least uh, supporting the kindergarten? I don't know if there's a one-to-one -one issue. And so I have a plan right here in front of me that's pretty detailed about the kind of support that is being brought into uh, Homestead in, in that grade. So rather than read through it, uh, what I can say is that there does appear to be some assignment of, uh, of a teacher aid in the two self-contained classrooms there. And then there's a whole host of other supports and there's a grant that has just been approved for funding to get foster grandparents in from the Catholic Charities. So you can, she's going to have foster grandparents coming in and she will assign those to uh, various kindergarten classes is my understanding. So that's encouraging there for that issue. But I want to also suggest that the new education bargain at the board's uh, persistent insistence uh, want, wanted lower class size. And, and, and they ha you have lower class sizes in all of the schools in the pre-K through two now continuum that were before much, much higher, much, much higher. Just, just two years ago, you were looking at 37, 38, 22, I'm sorry, 32, 29, 34 in a classroom in the early grades and no assistance. So the board has taken active, aggressive measures to try to reduce it. Is everything solved perfect? No. This is a lot of work. This is hard work. This is expensive work. But the fact is that most of the schools have an 18 to 22 ratio. 18 to 22. And if you're a school in good standing, then you have a 25 uh, class size ratio because you're in a school of good standing. Good standing. That's the facts. So let's, let's again, uh, Mr. Herbert, uh, prod us to, to correct the record whenever we can. So thank you. I'm, I'm correcting the record on the class size issue. Um, and then last but not least, there are two folks that uh, speak uh, fairly regularly, and I just want to comment to it. I always want to thank Mr. Fields <coughs> for the uh, enticement, the push to be better, and that we can work together, we can be better. Uh, and we're trying to do that. I do, I do believe in engendering that spirit. Uh, I don't believe that substitutes or anybody should be treated with uh, lack of respect, consideration, and honesty, as I heard one of the, one of the speakers say. 
uh, respect is an easy thing to give, and you get a lot, lot in return uh, when you do it. Uh, we don't have to agree every time, but we can be civil and we can be respectful. That is the kind of culture I'm trying to build here within my staff. If, if we fail on that or we falter on that, please uh, bring it to my attention so that uh, I can correct the staff member or I can correct the school that is uh, a miss in that. Take that very seriously that we treat each other with with the utmost respect and then of course um board member burns i'm sorry uh sherry, sherry burns uh, uh, I, I i like this reference that you made because the issue of disproportionality uh, continues to plague uh, the buffalo public schools it's an issue that we have pushed to a priority level uh, in this district, the board has has, has encouraged it and, and, and demanded it, in, in fact. And just this morning, I was meeting with all of my elementary principals and reaffirmed the priority that disproportionality, understanding it, what it means, and then attacking it aggressively and trying to reduce it first and then eliminate it uh, in our schools. It's going to take some uh, concerted effort. But we are aware of it, and, and we have brought in the New York University, NYU Steinhardt uh, Department um, that is has a special technical assistance center on disproportionality. They do a really, really great job in providing training for our staff, and they're training all of our principals. They're training all of our principals, and I believe then there's going to be some training for teachers. I'm not sure, but certainly they're starting with our principals. So the issue of disproportionality, some, which basically means that uh, some children are overrepresented in their disciplinary uh, referrals, in special education classes, in English language learner classes, and uh, get a disproportionate share of the behavioral discipline uh, suspensions and short and long term than other groups, and then. The underrepresentation issue is, so I call it over and under, is when they're not in challenging classes, rigor is not high as it needs to be because there's a perception that they're in special ed. They're in ENL, so <coughs> we should just kind of slow it down and not make it as rigorous. False. Uh, all of that has been a pattern in schools forever, and we're, we're working to aggressively uh, change that. High expectations for all students. Rigorous content for all students. You may do it a little differently. Your delivery and your style and your methods of teaching may may uh, vary, but the but the rigor and the content and the expectations uh, should not vary population to population. So we're working hard on all of that. Uh, I thought Jessica Bauer made made some good comments that <coughs> I thought were constructive relative to the parent facilitator piece, and that is as when we have this meeting. Uh, maybe we can talk about multiple roles and expand sort of the the roles around where that we really need in this in this uh, in this work, where we talk about community health workers, uh, prevention versus reaction work, um, being trained to be uh, de-escalators with with parents and because they're parents themselves. There's a lot of good proactive roles we could. Uh, give and, and help our, with our parent facilitators. We may just have to figure out another funding stream or another uh, subcontracting entity that could help us uh, with this so we could avoid some of these uh, challenges that we have on the fiscal side when it comes to the IRS and, and other kinds of things. We just have to get a little innovative and creative. So it's not, it's not, our, it's not done. Uh, let's keep working through this. I like those suggestions that are coming forth from the speakers. So in short, Thank you uh, for your participation. This is what good democracy is all about, and uh, we're glad to actually practice it here in yes, the Buffalo yes. Public Schools. And uh, we encourage the rest of the nation to do likewise. So thank you. God bless. Thank you, Superintendent. May, may I have a motion to excuse the following board members today? Uh, board member Jennifer McCousey, board member Barbara Nevergold and board member Catherine Franigan Priori. May I have a second, please? Paulette <laughs> and second by. And, yeah. All right, I need a motion to accept the minutes for 920. So move, so move, so move. <laughs> Was 
one correction on that meeting. Uh, the uh, student uh, board member's name needs to be corrected. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's see. We're going to start with our committee report. I'd like to start with our student board member to tell us what's been going on with the uh, with her students, her fellow students, and if she has anything to report today. Um, so today, um, we haven't had a meeting yet, but we're working on it going to on what we've seen in our schools. And every teacher that finds something up every year is our school lunches and how um, the nutrition value and how the new plan goes in our schools. We also, as said by some of the today, work concerned about uh, suspension rates and how for how long and how unaffected it is in our community. So those are things for now, but we're going to have Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, Patty uh, Pierce? Um, uh, I was absent uh, last week and had um, Board Member Quinn chaired my committee, so this is the report for the Educational Support Committee. Uh -oh. Yeah, and I don't. I can't remember where the committee's crossed over or not. But they're, they're, the issue on attendance, uh, my understanding was there was some question about the data, whether it was accurate or not. Um, back to us with a revamped system for dealing with uh, attendance and there are issues you raised, that, you know, whether somebody's not there or not. The absence count. I'm assuming that's going to be all. In I, well, I don't remember any comments when we're there. So they can get it clean. I think probably November should be realistic, but I'll, I'll have to double check when I meet with Eric and my dad. I think they were working. They were closed before, but I think IT, they needed a little bit more time. I'm, I'm expecting a little bit. And I, I, I want to use my own time <laughs> since I did yours. Um, just two things on, on what we heard tonight. One, one is uh, the fathers group, I used to call the fathers group, the peacekeepers have been around for almost 20 years. Um, they had, they did an extremely effective job. I went in the hallway and I asked, well, what's going on? You were, that we somehow rejected something. There is no proposal that we have in front of us. My understanding was they've been, according to them, they've been meeting with the district a lot and feel frustrated that they haven't brought up to an actionable item. I just can tell you that, short of them, and there are others in the community, there aren't many. A lot of these kids are at extreme risk, and I think this kind of thing is really important, given some of the money that we're spending here, I mean, $35,000. So I would encourage you to find out why that dialogue you're having with some people in district hasn't percolated up to your level or our level, and find out what's behind it, because it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And the other thing was, on this, um, Olmstead, I've got a number of parents calling me, and, and the issue isn't whether we've had uh, lower class sizes in educational bargaining. We're not filling positions that have been funded and are in place. They're, they're, I know that Olmstead has a larger uh, student-teacher ratio than the other schools we've implemented because it's a criterion school but it's, that's a good thing. They are not funding or filling the teacher aid positions. I don't know if you're worried about it. You're going to look into it. I'm not sure when I checked with Jamie yesterday before she wasn't happy. This is a lot of the TGS system positions that we're talking about. There's a sheet right here. The the process process. Okay, well, there's, you know, there, there's obviously a lag in when parents complain and when things happen. I called you they hadn't. <laughs> so it must have been the last week. No, I didn't know if they were filled. I was out of town. I couldn't send me an email. Well, we, can we get a specific, uh, just an email tomorrow saying, you know, said, let me go in pre-K. So the, the numbers of people, just so we know, because we're, you know, you get it too. Yeah, and, and I mean, I just, received, I just received an email last night from a woman who has children in the uh, Olmstead 64 kindergarten classroom, so that's incorrect. So, I, I mean, I, there's yeah, some, I there's either. some that, that the positions were filled because she's saying that there's still not an aide in her child's classroom as of yesterday. So it doesn't mean that that position was open. The question was, we're not filling positions well, that were allocated to the school. Principal fills the positions that she you know, says. That's different from the concern or the request that all the kindergarten sections well, receive an aid. 
true or not, they are different. But yeah. I, I, and I don't know the answer, but yeah. I was told by a parent that there were three teacher aid positions that were, in fact, in the budget and were unfilled. But, but let me just get the bottom of it. For the make, school, for the school, the whole school. No, no, for, the, for the, those grade levels. The, the Kindergarten? That's what I, really, I don't know the facts because yeah, I'm not right, but this I'm is saying. what the parents said. But I think that she makes an extremely good point. You, you, you can't have a teacher with 24 or 5 year olds and have no other adult helping. It doesn't, make sense. It doesn't necessarily have to be a teacher. Really? I mean, I'll push back on that. Okay, push away a lot. Well, I'm, not, I'm saying 25 yeah. is, is a really good number in this system when you had 37, 39, not 40 well, without any not, assistance for years. Well, that doesn't, so now that we're doesn't getting mean, it down. Yeah, wait, that doesn't mean no, wait, good. No, no. Now we're getting it down. Right. And to say that you have to have an assistant uh, in a kindergarten class of 25 is not necessary. That would be a new kind of conversation to have. Oh, I, That'd well, be a then, new then kind of I'm conversation. Gonna expand, I'm going to expand my request then and, and give us a report on all the kindergarten pre-K and how they're set up throughout the district. That's fine. Can we have that? But Dr. Cash, I can tell you, most I mean, of them don't have. But that, is, that is the conversation yeah. that we're yeah. having. I mean, that's that's the pro. That's is what the, the the class sizes at Olmstead 64. I don't believe there's been parents that have come to speak at least at, at least at this board meeting from any other school regarding kindergarten classrooms. Right. 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 So you're saying in a school of good standing, it's 25 students as a maximum. No, I'm right? saying that's not unusual in American public education to have a kindergarten class of 25 and not necessarily have an assistant. But each one of the parents that have come forward and have, have spoke at this meeting have all indicated that there was a precedent where there were aides in the kindergarten classrooms. This is the first year where th there's not an aide in each room. And I was told it was a school-based budget, just like you said, that the positions needed to be filled and that those aides were going to be placed within those classrooms. And as of yesterday, mm. it hasn't happened. Okay, well, that's not what the principal says. So. I don't want to argue yeah, public yeah, about yeah. it. The principal has a clear report here. She's in control. You know, she's in charge of her school. But we'll we'll, we'll, we'll follow up and see. What does the principal say that there are teacher assistants yeah. in the in the kindergarten? Yeah, she does. Okay, hey, well, if you can share that with us, I mean, I, I, but I'd like to know. Not on all of them. Not on all of them. Well, then no. Okay. no, because it's not it's not in the budget. It's not allocated. That's my point to you. It was never allocated. Well, we just got a report. A, 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 an assistant for every kindergarten class. In, we just in, got a report in, last week in, that, uh, we, that we are, you know, I don't want to use the word, but we spent $20 million less than budgeted, on, and a lot of it were positions. So, yeah, so yeah. Uh, 11.7. The point is, it's a lot of money, and, and it just doesn't, it just, anyway. I'd like to know how we're how we've staffed all the kindergarten classes then, how many people we have in the room, teachers, teachers assistants, what was funded, what's filled. Yeah, we have a chart to show. Back in that. You know your chart and that the green and the of all of the ratio and who's in and yes, what do you that have will, that? That will show the number of students, it won't show number of teacher assistants, but we can get that information. No, but it'll show ratio. Um only if the, if they went over and we assigned an extra assistant. Right, so this school is not over, right? No, they're they're at twenty five, so they're not. Right. Mm -hmm. So across the board, K to two, you have the chart because it's our class size reduction initiative that shows each P, each K, each one, each two, mm -hmm. and what their class size are. It showed, yeah, it would absolutely show their. Okay, classes. so it wouldn't be much to then say whether. Just looking at kindergarten, for example, across the district, which ones have an aid and which ones don't? We would know the ones that we directly assigned, absolutely, because we said uh, these numbers warrant an extra aid or assistant and or because it's a multilingual classroom, we felt that there was a need there. Schools also have building aids that they can assign, so we wouldn't know right. necessarily who's cycling through kindergartens in some schools. Right. So like tw 64, I believe, they cycle through those classes. They're not assigned all day. But we could certainly pull the principles and get that information. Right. But the point you just made is, 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 the, is the issue. You just said we can certainly show where we thought it was germane to put an assistant. And we have that. And then schools themselves have an allocation of X number of A's, let's say three, for the whole school. And they might use that A <coughs> to cycle through. And it could cycle through kindergarten. It could cycle through grade three and so forth. But there's nothing in any of our policy or practice 
it says that all kindergarten teachers must have or will have an aid. So this is this is this is what I'm trying to just clarify. And be, and That's what I'm clarifying. Even for that school. And nobody said there is such a policy. Basically, one of the practice. What are the facts? What what what? How we how we step kindergarten drop it? We'll see school by someone, and then we can make a policy decision here. We can we can overrule that if we want to. Well, that's not acceptable. But yeah. Let's let's start with the facts. You can, and then I'll help to educate you around. It. We'll have a conversation. Oh, that's fine. So the first thing they want to know is is that what's the staff like? Yes. Because one of the things about this uh, idiosyncratic case is that there was also uh, misinformation. We spent a lot of time trying to correct it that the school used to have a 16 to 1 ratio or a 12 to 1 ratio and so forth and so on and they were misunderstanding the difference between some of our uh, you know special education assigned kinds of classes versus regular so-called gen ed and yeah, self-contained kindergarten and so forth there was never any that, ratio of 16 to 1 or 12 to 1. Even, huh? I'm not getting that from parents I'm not even getting that, that they're arguing about a policy they're just saying this isn't acceptable the way it is. They don't know where policy is. So, okay. so they're not talking we'll about you, special we'll ed you, classes. We'll give you the uh, we are and we can go from there. Well, it's district wide though, not just not just Olmsted. That's what I'm saying. Can I interject here? When we originally started talking about uh, going into the smaller classroom sizes, uh, the goal I thought was to put as much intensity as we could in the first three to four years of the child's education. And if we're going to be competitive with uh, charter schools and other schools, we're going to have to look at that formula and make sure that our children <coughs> have additional support because they are reading at different levels, they are doing things at a different level, and it is very difficult for at that age limit. And I've witnessed it, and I'm in agreement with looking into seeing what we can do. When uh, anytime we can brag, uh, and for the public, when we have our workshops, it's typically the second week. Uh, second Wednesday of the month, a lot of details are discussed. If we're in a situation where we can put $11.7 million back into the general fund or not fill in positions, I think we should have a conversation about doing things and making sure that's not an issue moving forward. And if we have that type of access going in, I think we need to work on getting some additional help in those uh, early years. Yeah, what I agree is that we should get a full description and sharing of what are the supports our pre K through two continue and receive uh, what our kindergartens receive. Let's get an understanding of what they are receiving, and then we'll go from there. Right, I agree, but I feel that we need more hands-on inside the classrooms. I've been saying this for as long as I've been sitting here, and this is a, a typical example. I feel that we need more add-ons in our ninth grades when we have children that are coming in reading under level, and I don't mean an instructional person, I mean someone to sit there and actually work with the child in the classroom. So we can have, have that conversation in, in our yeah. workshops or in our committees, and we can, uh, who's gonna pick it up? Patty, is that student support? Educational support. Educational support. You can pick it up on your in your committee. Does that work? Okay, or does it go into student I achievement? Think more under, yeah. Okay, you wanna student go into student yeah. achievement? <laughs> it seems like to me it's both yeah. issues. Mm -hmm. But you, can you handle that in your report? Uh, on your, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, that's good, because I really feel we need to address that if we're going to make our children as tough as they can be by grade three. All right, um, let's move forward. Um, Hope, do you have anything to report? Um, just that I've been working with Dr. Rosser and Judge Friedman in the Eric County Family Court. I have... Uh, volunteer to be on their committee, which is the committee that was formed to build a bridge between the court system and the district. So I, I got ahead of meeting with them yesterday and then sat in on my first committee meeting today. So I'm hoping to be able to do some good work in, in my dual role as a family court attorney and school board member. So I'm just curious, how does Judge Hannah fit into that equation? Because he is our representative for our district. Uh, Judge Hannah's in city court. This so is a family court. We're, we're talking does. about the juveniles. Right. So we don't, you don't deal with him. You're not, uh, Dr. K, Judge Hannah, uh, didn't he replace um, McLeod in that position or something? City, court. city court. Is that city court? Uh, it's family court. So she's talking family court. Yes. Okay, so. Kids. The county building. Hmm? 
We're working with the, the Department of Social Services. We're working with probation. We're working with the family court judges and other family court uh, liaison people. Okay, so the city court does the disciplinary piece as far as it's our criminal. Children? City court's criminal. Family court is a civil court. Okay. City court judge Hannah handles cases, cases that kids that are or adults arrested for uh, he's working with uh, rehabilitation rather than re rather than incarceration. Okay, so I'm going to reach out to him because someone told me that we need to um, look into um, see what we can do to supplement your green that piece of the form. Okay, all right. So we'll reach out to him and see where we are with him. I had a good uh, liaison with uh, Judge McLeod, and I haven't talked with. Uh, Hannah, since he, just Hannah, since he's taken over that position. So I'll see where we are, and if there's something we can bring to assist him, then I'll bring it before the board. Board Member Woods, you had your, uh, chaired your first uh, committee meeting. And yes. Would you like to tell us about it? Well, I, I did enjoy my very first chairing of finance and options meeting. We did get a report on the status of our uh, financials. Our auditors did give us an unqualified opinion, the highest opinion available, and they stated at that time that our financial position had improved by $18 million. So I was very pleased with their report, but it be, uh, the improvements on our financial positions is important to me. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Triggs and I attended School 37 with uh, a presentation on our uh, called Generation Yes, the new technology where the students are actually teaching all of the students and the teachers how to take care of their board docs, their computer equipment, how to calibrate their pens, and there our ambassadors are teaching the children to respect the, the equipment we're giving uh, giving out to them and how to use it and to log into Schoology. It was just a wonderful program. So on the programmatic side, it's exciting to see the children happy and excited about learning and teaching adults. And they committed, some of them, to be looking at becoming teachers <laughs> because of this experience. And these are sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. So that was great. So I, those are my two positives for for the finance ops. Dr. Tiggs? Uh, at the end of September, I attended the CUBE conference. CUBE stands for Council of Urban Boards of Education. It's an affiliate of NISBA. And um, I attended three really critical workshops. One was on OCR, and we had a couple of uh, board attorneys from out of state who talked, who shared that. Um, they gave us some updates, and I brought copies for everyone here and passed them out last week. But they talked about with the present administration, i.e. 45, that um, the OCR complaints are going to probably now favor more districts than complaints, and that's something we need to be aware of. And in the handout, they gave us information how a district should, should sort of like a checklist, if you will, to be sure that they are doing mm -hmm. the right thing. So it's a, it was a very good... Um, workshop. I attended also a workshop regarding charter schools um, and the thesis there was that we're in, we're, if we're in the battle between us and them, traditional charter is the wrong fight, we don't have enough money in our city schools, period. And they said that is the fight we should be fighting, period. They also believe we should try very hard. Those districts that have state um, personnel as authorized of charter schools, we should get it back. It should be the LEA if there's going to be charter school. Very interesting conversation. Very, very. And lastly, I was in a workshop talking about writing a policy for uh, racial equity. And I've shared all of that copies with the board as well. On October 11th, we had the Student Achievement Committee meeting. It was uh, robust and uh, very, um, very in depth. And, and Dr. Cash presented and provided just very good information uh, about the context around uh, the 
standardized scores that we see in our school, uh, the comparative analysis between charter schools and others. So we really get a full picture. It's so easy to talk about where the district is without talking about all these other entities. But we really need to understand the whole picture to have a real good conversation about student achievement. So I appreciate that, Dr. Cash. It was very informative. And we had handouts and all that good stuff. It was school by school. It was great. On October 13th, on Friday the 13th, I attended the disproportionality meeting for the district with Dr. Hernandez from NYU. It was an excellent meeting. It was from 8.15 to 8.30. I want to say kudos to the parents. Parents were there. That was wonderful. Teachers were there. Uh, assistant principals and principals. I am glad what uh, Dr. Cash said today that it is the district's priority. The principals will be leading this work. The expectation that they will be there to lead the work. And uh, it is phenomenal, phenomenal. And what she did this first module, we will be going for the next, I think, four or five months. Um, four or five months. Um, what she did was lay the groundwork. Let's get some understanding about terminology. You know, we just throw out words like everybody thinks the same definition, and most of the time it's not true. So she did very, very well. We have homework and reading. So, Anne, I hope you get to those principals who weren't there, the homework, so that they can get that because the expectation is second we can have a good, we can get into a good conversation. Uh, Tuesday, October 17th, I met with the teacher candidates from Megar Everest College at Emerson Common, first of all. It was just wonderful. I think it was 15, 20 of them? 15, 20 pre-service teachers from Edgar Evers College, and they had the opportunity, they were divided among four schools, and they had the opportunity to go in any classroom they wanted, and they took notes about their observations. When we came back to Emerson Common before dinner, the professors had them align their observations with the standards they had been learning about. Very, 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 very good. It was just wonderful. And this is all part of the NBK. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? <coughs> uh, Dr. Cash was there. Mr. Brown was there. Peg Beretti was there. It was wonderful. These students were so excited about what they saw and their potential to become a teacher. And they felt that what they experienced in Buffalo in these classrooms, they were like, wow, it happens like that. And many of them said, looking back in retrospect, their own elementary classrooms were not like that. It was huge. I went home happy, and the food mm -hmm. at Emerson Commons was absolutely <laughs> excellent. <laughs> it was delicious. Just kudos to Emerson. Where's Weimer? <laughs> uh, that thing, they're just doing their thing over there. Don't um, tell Weimer. <laughs> yeah, I have to. It was just great. Tell the principal that's there now. I am. I did, I did tell her. Work here. But that was just great <laughs> stuff. Uh, and then... And, and uh, by the way, Teresa, okay. thank you. They were all diverse teachers, Muslim, African, African American, and there, uh, you know, Dr. Cash, he went there with about thinking uh, about Buffalo and their future yep. as students, as teacher candidates, as master students, and as professionals. So that was great too. They're like, "Wow, really?" Because they, some of the principals even took them to Canal Side. They gave them a little tour of Buffalo, and they were really impressed. So it was a great time. Finally today, uh, myself and board member Woods, we went to School 37 and had a presentation by 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, the Gen Yes Club. And these students showed us, <coughs> and Dr. Cressy, I'm going to share with the UTA, I think we should do some cross stuff, and it showed me that even ninth grade is too late. Because what those kids show us a video where they taught a class how to do a certain specific task with their computers. And they did the whole lesson plan, they did assessments, they delivered it, and then they followed up with questions and answers. It was excellent. And so it was Mr. Sanjay Galani. It was excellent. And they said you visited with them. Uh, you didn't do the poster, you didn't do the task, but you were there a couple times. Uh -huh. These kids were phenomenal, and I think we need to share that. Um, and we need to see that grow in other schools because their excitement about learning and they did have some asks. They asked, <laughs> they asked uh, if we could, if we could, they need laptop bags to take home. They don't want to carry their laptops and things by themselves. They would like a bag. Um, and some chargers. And some chargers to charge their equipment. So if we can think about that and think about supporting them, they want this club to grow. So that was great.
thank you. School 37. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Tig. I know we are excited that you're retired. <laughs> we are no, what does it, who the said that, Dick? No, 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 no. And what, what does that mean? Let's that take means, a moment that probably. means that you have more time to devote <laughs> to help us and do what we need to help. Well, I enjoy this. Thing. You say students, I'm there. It's really not that's an appropriate it's word. It's really that you're renewed and really not tired at all. No. And so we will be seeing a lot more of you in yes. schools. That's thank what you it means. Yes. So that's yes. how we meant to say yeah, And just at the end, thank you for saying that. I did visit uh, Bill today. Mr. Garcia was at a principal's meeting. I had a lovely conversation with his assistant. I forgot his name again. Andrew Druin. Andrew Druin, just phenomenal. But of course, I always like to go visit with yeah. the principal, so I wouldn't. I didn't go visit, but we had a great conversation. Sure. They appreciate the support and that they're getting from the different departments. They see things changing. So I was excited. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay, executive. I'll try not to be so excited next time. That's okay. We <laughs> contagious. Let's help. It. Thank you. Um, executive <laughs> affairs met. Uh, we discussed competitive bidding process. Uh, uh, Mr. Kuzman uh, gave us some information in addition to that on the bid protest process and policy review. Uh, IT presented Smart Schools Investment Plan, and we had a discussion about changing the board work sessions to an additional day a month. In addition to that, uh, I have visited um, several schools. Um, I uh, attended an event with the superintendent in regards to a uh, Madai opening up in Upward Bound at MST. We're very excited uh, at the end of September to see that. I've also met with uh, Dr. Mauricio um, and Aubrey Lord in regards to the issues associated with the Bennett um, football team. One of, um, we had a very good meeting on that. Uh, 925 next year I'd like the staff to be challenged to to remember the day of remembrance It's the last Monday in September it is uh, a way of honoring uh, victims who have been murdered in the community I attended that event it was beautiful I've met with Alfred State uh, in regards to things that are uh, things that they want to do for the uh, Burgard community I attended Lydia Wright's community night uh, met some beautiful parents there and uh, Dr. Uh, or soon to be Dr. Cassandra Wright uh, assisted a parent in regards to some concerns and they are very happy and I want to thank you for ha helping that parent with that. I've had uh, several team meetings with uh, the Burgard uh, team, uh, school team uh, trying to uh, just support them and make sure that Burgard continues to excel. Uh, I attended the Buffalo Public High School showcase, met with uh, at least 10 parents in regards to what's going on and I have some ideas that I'm going to share with Eric Rosser in regard and Kathy Hindley in regards to that. Uh, attended the football battle between Burgard and Bennett and I was neutral that day. I had on my regular clothes. I wasn't wearing any jerseys. Okay. All right. Met with Assemblywoman Crystal Peoples along with Dr. Nevercole, uh, Dr. Tiggs as well as um, Paulette Woods. Um, in regards to some issues that we were that are concerning us uh, and my biggest disappointment over the past 30 days was when I attended the Western New York STEM awards banquet uh, in which they nominate um, schools for uh, progressive things that they are doing and we did not have one application submitted it was at Damon College and we're going to make sure that we fix that for next year we're working on that I've already started working on that uh, Saturday, attended the Bennett Hall uh, Sports Hall of Fame from the alumni. This is their 15th annual. Mm -hmm. They are committed to helping us uh, to move uh, Bennett to the very next level. Uh, and I have an idea about that. You know, when, it, when I go to these things, I come up with ideas. You should be happy about that team. Mm -hmm. Burgard, <laughs> uh, uh, the PTA for MST had their first meeting yesterday. I attended that. Uh, uh, very proud of our uh, team there. Mr. Baker, Principal Baker was there along with Ina Ferguson. We had a nice crowd and I am encouraging all schools to consider uh, putting PTAs in their uh, buildings. Uh, there are so many um, uh, amenities that come with that membership, one of which is a liability policy for a million dollars, which is why we've been able to attract certain community partners to work with us at um, MST. Um, met with Citizen Action before this meeting today. 
along with uh, Samantha and Charlie, as well as Sue Gillick, uh, to put us on, uh, to reacquaint ourselves with each other and to put us on a perspective. Uh, Dr. Rosser has scheduled a meeting toward the end of uh, this month in regards to uh, some, con some concerns associated with citizen action and Erie County restorative justice. And I also had breakfast with um, Mrs. Macuzzi before she left town um, with the PUSH uh, committee or, or whatever they are. They are just awesome. PUSH is just the place to be. And Dr. Cash, I came up with an idea sitting next to, um, sitting next to me. David <laughs> and uh, Tino, uh, who was uh, Samato, who was there. And I thought about how nice it would be for us to have a breakfast, a fundraiser, where we have all of our vendors assist us in raising some money for our uh, nonprofit that we have. So maybe we can work on that because there was a room full of people and they had a goal, I think, of around 25000 I thought we could do 100000 easily and put something together. I know with your leadership. So anyway, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Cash so that he can tell us what's going on with him and then we're going to move forward to our consent agenda. Colleagues, I'd like to first thank all of the board members that are inserting themselves into this work uh, directly. I think it's making a difference in a good, significant way. So thank you to all of you. I hear your reports. It's really encouraging. And I certainly appreciate it. I know the children and the families and staff appreciate it as well. Second, uh, Dr. Nevergold is not here. She's traveled to Council of Gray City Schools along with six of my staff. Um, but I would say that uh, if she were here, I think one of the things she'd report on, she's been busy this month, but one of the things she'd report on that I was very proud of to be a part of, uh, along with former board member Mary Ruth Kapsiak, is that over at the Central, Central Registration Center the other day, uh, she has initiated an effort to bring uh, supply packs, uh, backpacks, uh, and provide supplies, a lot of material. She's working very closely with Mr. Micah, I believe his name is, at the teacher desk, who's a tremendous benefactor. Uh, has pledged six million dollars on an ongoing basis to provide supplies to teachers. He's been doing that for a long time. But we we, we brought that. She brought that initiative along with. Uh, tell me, the Savoy, AKA. AKA. I'm sorry. She's the president. I'm sorry, AKA. And uh, we had our cultural resource specialist there. <laughs> the issue is, colleagues, that 64 families and children have come in uh, in just the last several weeks from the four uh, states that were uh, most affected and ravaged in recent uh, uh, climate issues. So we, we have from Texas, Florida, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. The bulk of coming in from Puerto Rico uh, next is, is uh, Florida. And so we're receiving these families with a very warm welcome. The cultural resource specialists are translating, and then they're getting these really marvelous uh, backpacks and connections to any other services that they might need. Many of these children and families came with just the clothes uh, on their back. And so to see the board uh, make this effort to reach out and support these families, I think is very special. Uh, last, uh, I would ask at this time, I've been encouraging our team as they, as they continue to grow in this work to present at national conferences whenever they can. And it's somewhat unprecedented. I've been in this work a long time. We will have seven presenters uh, at the Council of Great City Schools tomorrow. Um, I have to present early in the morning. So I'm asking for you to uh, let me go and get on this road. I'm going to be driving to Cleveland. Jim Weimer and others have scared me to death here being on the route and uh, made it so bad that I'm thinking about, I don't know, I don't know, I'm thinking about not going, but the point is that, <laughs> I, uh, that I gotta go now in order to get the rest that I need to present early in the morning. Absolutely. So I'm just going to ask you to do that. The staff has been working downstairs, they're ready to show me this final uh, presentation. Uh, but we'll represent well and uh, we'll come back and share uh, with you you know, the next time, I'll probably write it up on that's Monday. Awesome. So, I, I asked thank on you. Wednesday if we could have the list of who's presenting what, you know, the little synopsis they get in We'll the send book. that to you. Could you please send that to you tomorrow morning. Yeah. That'll be okay. great. Thank that's you. Nice. And thank you. Have a that's good, good news. That's good news. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Can I have a motion for our consent agenda? Can I get a motion, Patty? Second? Yes, Paulette. Um, okay. Um, number, Mr. Quinn, uh, 16A, Lamar Advertising. Yeah, I mean, it, I, it just seems like an enormous waste of money. Uh, you know, you heard all these needs we're talking about. And yeah, in a real world, it'd be really nice to advertise something on like billboards. Uh, I don't even think it's an effective way to communicate with, with people and families. And I just don't understand why we're doing it. I agree. So we did a billboard campaign last year. We're going to open the community schools. And we had billboards closest to the community schools alerting the community that they were open to everyone. Uh, this year they will have the name of the school. They will have engage, enroll, achieve on them because we are taking enrollment in those schools on an ongoing basis. Um, it, it puts us in the league with uh, schools outside of the district that are doing advertising. We feel we have a lot to offer the students and the community and that it will grow our uh, participation yes well, if I had a choice between teacher aides and uh, the Olmstead school funding the, the, the uh, peacekeepers this is not money from the operational budget I this should mention this is money that it comes from community school funding that was procured by David Mauricio and so the community school to be funding used can't be used to for this purpose. intervention groups in the communities for violence and things that can't be used for that they can be used for, say, passage. They can be used for things of that nature. Um, well, why aren't we doing that instead of this? Well, we're, we're doing a multi-tier approach. Uh, so we've upgraded our website. Um, we have Facebook. We have Twitter. We're getting into a text reminder system. We have flyers that we're producing. We last year sent home a uh, to every resident in, in the city of Buffalo uh, for a, a quad sheet. So we're doing that as well. We're also uh, wanting to have engagement with the community okay, right. presence uh, in each of the communities by the school with pictures of, of kids and families that represent. Now, one thing uh, you might ask is, how do we know whether we're getting the, the best bang for the buck? Is it really working? Um, so in our, we're moving to a iPad system uh, for registration. We were normally having people sign in. So the question that they will uh, answer is, how did you hear about the community schools? And they'll have options, billboard, flyer, a friend. Um, so we're testing the system right now with, with a variety of different um, uh, venues of getting to, to the families. And this is one of them. I, I go back to my comment. I, mean, I, I think you have serious problems in each of these community school areas. And billboard advertising typically works in high traffic, you know, Kensington Expressway, the throughway when you're in, you know, it, it's not really used very often in small neighborhood setting anymore. And I'm just saying, it, to me it's a question of our priorities. Why? You, you've heard all these issues in the community. And I, 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 and you're I right think right for a big box advertiser, those, those high visibility places probably make sense um, for, for stores, for retail. These are community schools appealing to the people who live right where the schools are. And so that's where these billboards will be. Talking about, you said buy a lot of billboards. And what we found was they really only are effective reaching out people in high traffic, through way kind of thing, and the message is really simple. In any event, of all the priorities we have, this doesn't seem to be one of them. I, I'd ask the board to consider um, approving this, and we will bring back data from our iPad registration system that lets us know where we're getting um, uh, the best bang for the buck. Is it the website? Is it the flyer? Is it the billboard? Is it a combination of all? And if it's not working, then we, we pull back and we seize the opportunity to move forward. And we can do that in, in a quarterly. We don't have to go on throughout the entire year, but we can take a few months to really see whether it does have impact or not and pull it back if it's not. I, I do also want to mention that we have the capability of switching out the vinyls on the billboards for uh, three times within a year so that there can be other messages that are that are put out there. And you're right if you said you reached 22,000 people. Is that accurate? Did you get that count? 22,000 is who came through the doors. But as far as visibility, it takes a while to get 
an idea and a brand ingrained in the mind of the public and get them used to the idea. And, and of course, word of mouth helps too. But this is a, a real, the, the campaign is so community centric around those particular schools that that, that visibility just seems to be a really good way to, to get the attention of, of the people we most want to reach that are sometimes hard to reach. And, and they are hard to reach because most of them don't have computers and quite a few of them don't have smartphones. So when I'm looking at this list, what you're basically saying is, is that uh, if you don't put it in an uh, area where these, this, this appears to be in areas where there are very, uh, our low income people live. This is what it looks like to me. No, I understand. I'm, I'm saying two things. I don't think billboards, I mean, $83,000. Uh, you could hire somebody to go door to door every day and knock on every house in these districts and not spend this kind of money. Billboard advertising, I'm just saying, is just not an effective way to, uh, to do what you're talking about doing. And I also, in the priority need, it doesn't, doesn't meet my our priorities in the state. Well, I guess we all have to <laughs> Is this with special funding or this comes out of community? It's coming out of our community school set aside. But we can do other things with that funding. Yeah. Yeah, who who recommends, what uh, consultant or somebody that knows how to do this recommend we do billboards? We, we worked with Say Yes, uh, and they hired a consultant to work with us. This was, all stems who from a who was, the, who was the consultant? Within, with Say who Yes. The, somebody. Latrice Myers, who, who worked with, um, She's a marketing she's a person. Trying to think. Yeah, she's, she's a marketing PR person. person. Um, but this this initially stems from last year when I, I got a $30,000 grant from Oshai. I went out and got money from outside okay, to do this campaign. For this. Um, mm -hmm. That was a one-off, and, and it's possible that we'll be able to do that again. But no, they are not paying for this particular campaign. But I mean, how are their words? There will be 15 and with three um, th three bonus boards uh, per flight, so a total of 18 boards right, centered right where we need them. And the purpose of these billboards is to do what exactly you're trying to increase last year interest in the community schools. Yes, last year it was it was mostly just a, an awareness. Here we are. You know, we have community schools open to everyone here for you. And we wanted the entire community to understand that they could come in. This year, our message is a little different because we're also encouraging them to enroll in the schools and to use the parent centers more heavily also. For those people that don't have computers in their homes, this is a way for them to come in and access our technology. And also take courses to help their children with academics and to um, take advantage of different services that come into the community schools to um, support families right there. So and that how they, did you get all that across on the billboard? That is, and on the billboard is there's a community school near you, and it's it's open to everyone. Can and you so, pass that around? Can you pass that sure. Around? Sure. These are pro these are rough prototypes. Okay. Um, they're not the, the finals, but that is basically what they'll say. You can't get real wordy on a billboard. And again, you know, we are rebuilding our reputation in the Buffalo Public Schools as a place to come on Saturdays and in the evenings. That hasn't happened in decades. And it's not like we're, we're a real high-profile sort of entity. We're not, we're not like a sports team or, or a, a big box store. We're schools. And we haven't offered this sort of thing in the past. I know, I've never seen a billboard for a public school. I've seen it for private schools and colleges. There you go, though. But but I that's the, the idea. The they time. have things to offer. Yeah, I see them for charter all the time. Right. Right. Charter right. schools and, and parochial right. schools. Right. And they all have their bill, their billboards up. And they usually do that when it's recruitment time for yeah. families yeah. to enroll. Right. Um, so we are actually using this uh, two, two means one. One is to get people to go to our website, go to our community schools, go to our placement office, and ask. I saw a billboard about a community school. What is it? What's involved in it? If we're putting it right in the community, right where the people live. Uh, we are starting our walking school buses, so as people are walking in our walkable neighborhoods, we want them to be part of that. Uh, we are only in about a month of our community school Saturday programs, and already we have broken 3,000 uh, uh, attendance. And that, that will help us set a record this year in comparison.
comparison to last year where we started with, uh, we had about 22. But to Larry's point, uh, I mean, just, we had a, we had a, you had the whole thing, I don't have one with me, of any schools, and it went to every household in Buffalo, I think. The quad folk, mm -hmm. yes. The quad folks. So that wasn't effective? That was $26,000 for a one shot. It was twenty. So you could do almost four of these. Um, it's me. It makes more sense to have that in my home and in my hand. We're you looking it in your car right. versus perhaps a book. We're looking at doing uh, postcards, quarterly, phone yeah. books. Why not hire some of these kids that need a buck, print up handbills, and pay them to go door to door to hand them? It's a way to get money in the hands of kids. I guess, you know, we used to do a lot of advertising. We would do it. It's difficult on the heels of the people that spoke today and, you know, these, these issues that are that are so yeah. prevalent. You know, and it, it really made, made me think, the like, and the one woman who, you know, you should be ashamed how do you sleep at night, you know, I mean, it just seems like this is a frivolous kind of first world thing that we don't really have the luxury to spend the eighty six thousand six thousand dollars on billboards when we have all of these other very pressing mm -hmm. concerns. Until you look at what a community school is and what we've built there and what we offer there. I mean families come in, it's a go to destination. We've seen it has been it's phenomenal. It has been our no, inroads. I'm not saying anything I'd like to put the money back into the school as opposed to sharing it with the school. No, we, we want people to come in. We want them to come in for, for breakfast and academic achievement and health and wellness and sports and uh, fun and arts and crafts and then lunch and then maybe the parent center and, you know. You know I'm, hear, I'm hearing you that this is a new initiative. This is a new bargain for the parents. It is a new item where we want people from the neighborhoods to come into these schools. The parent centers are a new initiative, and we don't want them to. to we don't want them to be a secret, a well kept secret. To we want them to be a well utilized. Uh, the emphasis. And well, if you're getting 22,000 people, it's not a secret. So it. it, it um. Well, 22,000 people, that should be upwards of. That's not even one person per Oh. Yeah, we're, we're happy with so that. I agree. I see they, they need okay. something. So and you know what? The fact that it's asking people to enroll in these community schools, I think it's worth pulling just, I mean, just uh, denying it just for that. Because certainly we don't want to give the impression that we're doing neighborhood, neighborhood schools. schools. Well, <laughs> it's more than just that. It's what? Uh, don't need any programs. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I think to Larry's mm -hmm. point, I think we need to readdress this and see if there's other ways. Because um, a billboard is a billboard is a billboard, but it's nice to have something in your hand, perhaps, whether kids go out and take it door to door, mm -hmm. or whether you send it out again. I think, um, I think we also we, are doing doing that. I'm about to say, I think we're doing several different so methods. I, I would continue, and and this. So that's one of the multi-layered approaches for awareness. That's right. Is that included? Hold on. Is that included in the eighty-three thousand? No. This is just the dollar. We fund the peacekeepers out there and then we put it their dual mission to go out and bring people in. I mean, maybe start it for water and give the rest of the peacekeepers. Okay, so that's not their function. That's not. That's not their function. Okay, so um, all right. So are you debating this? I do I need to refer this to committee, or what do you want me to do? Well, we didn't vote on it yet. Well, we can pull it from the item if you need this more Lamar, questions. Where did you go? Right if you need more questions, this Lamar charging us full prices. No, no, we beat them up really well. <laughs> yeah, I mean that yeah. it's our due to do that. Yeah. Well, right. I mean because we are, you know, yeah. Yeah. No, we we got them down and down and down yeah. again, and it's yeah. going in concerns of money yeah. and then the finance changes to finance uh, finance finance uh, finance uh, no no business we were pretty tonight and they are happy to have the board you know okay there's a lot of discussion on this i think we should pull it um this is a contract involved we can put it in executive affairs if you like and you can or find which one do you recommend finance right 
Okay, okay. executive affairs, uh, if we, uh, according to the attorney. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. That we pull this item? Okay, this item has been pulled. Okay, okay. thank you. All right, let's go next to um, Larry Quinn, item C and D, CIR Electrical, number 16, C and D. I got a number of issues on this, okay? I mean, first of all, it's all I, it, it, rightfully so, hear about wanting to have minority companies involved in the district. Mm -hmm. So when you make a bid, that just one bid for all the schools, this is putting in smoke detectors. It's putting in probably a, a dedicated line, electric line and poking up some smoke detectors. By my calculation, it's costing you almost $3,000. If you think about it for a little bit, you could carbon monoxide, not smoke. But well, they're the okay. I'm right. sorry. No, but I mean it's, it's the just, same deal. Why can't they just take the ones with the batteries? No, no. Well, you could, well I, I was going to ask a little bit, but let's assume that it's a requirement that we hardwire. Okay, I'm no, assuming it's <laughs> totally <somewhere else. laughs> no, So I have a couple of questions. <laughs> one, is, we don't even have them now. They're but, not even in the schools. Right. That's so the first sure question would be. Is it the New York State have requirements, which you say it is? Correct. And, it, and it can't be battery operated, which Correct. you say it is. Okay. And the urgency is what? The urgency is the new regulation for the gas, uh, any gas units. When did that regulation come out? It just, that, that's what we're addressing from the New York well, when, State. When, when, when I don't have the date on that, but we're, go, we're complying with the regulation. Was it this year? Was it last year? Mm -hmm. what was this year. Okay. So. You're spending approximately three thousand dollars a detector. If I'm doing my math right, I'm assuming there's 57 schools, and you said eight to ten. I gave you the high side of ten, so it's 570 of these things. First of all, if you broke them down school by school, you got a lot of smaller guys bidding on this. Mm -hmm. Number two, you could train. You know, we can go to whoever's doing electrical um, CTE in the district. This could be almost a student product. This is not hard stuff. Just put the circuit and attaching a couple of detectors to it. It's, it's electric. I can't do it. <laughs> but but it's electrician 101. Okay. It, it blows my mind that mm -hmm. you're spending. I mean, I've done a whole house electric for like five six thousand dollars. You're spending almost thirty thousand a school. It's a this is this is a capital project. that's ninety eight percent reimbursable. Oh, okay. We're not so spending. We're not. We're, the district is not spending. The, the, both of these CRR, we, we always come to this where it comes back. We're spending it. These are capital projects. Okay, then let we me get ninety-eight percent reimbursement. Let me go to my threshold question. Why didn't you set up the bid so that you bid every school, school by school, so we had active participation smaller? <coughs> the, that was the RFP that went out. The Ferguson well, and CRO. The RFP. I'm sorry. I'm assuming your office wrote the RFP. Mm -hmm. Correct. This is, a, this is a great job. Like if you want to talk about minority companies, I don't know if there's any woman electrician, you, and you give a guy, there's not very, I don't know any minority contractors that can bond a million six job. Maybe there are None. some. I know a lot that can do 30,000. So if you broke these things down into size and size of could, and you'd probably get better pricing. Yeah, so I, I don't care if the state's reimbursed. I, I agree paying, with you. Use our money respectively. And I look and at the that. The same goes for the hand dryers. Mm -hmm. I flagged the same one because when I looked at the bids, they sent it out to five or six companies. They only got one bid, and I think wow. Ferguson is a, a minority contractor. They are not. A minority. Well, they're not. Well, bottom line is I didn't see any. They did advertise it, but I don't see. I don't. I don't see but one response. So there's something wrong with the process. So I, I agree with you. If they broke well, there's it something down. really wrong with the process. A, that you only got two bids, and B. I know it's easy to bid the whole district, but if you bid it in, in maybe in groups of three schools, you get a different result. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Quinn. Yeah, we bid it. Seventeen eight. Well, what do you, you want to add anything to that, Jeff? At all? Yeah. Start bidding. <laughs> Is there anything with the bidding process itself? No. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming Nate and Jeff. There's nothing to prevent you from. Doing them in groups of two or three schools at a time, right? Okay. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Quinn. Okay, 17. Hey, Mr. Quinn. You're on roll. <laughs> Twice. What? What? You're on roll, Mr. Quinn. Uh, 17A was there's no other bidders. And, and 
I, I find it hard to believe with all the pest control guys we have in Buffalo that only one person did it. This is an extension of an existing contract from 2014. This is the last year of the extension. We go into open bids in uh, the following year. This is an extension. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Quinn, 21A. 21A, the audit. So uh, we last board meeting approved up to $8 million to fund three issues that were basically management issues that we never anticipated the IRS is after. So there was so much talk tonight about the parent facilitators, the um, custodial engineers, and the cosmetic writer for, for everybody but retirees. Those cost the district $8 million that we're going to ultimately, or something thereabouts, I guess when you settle with them, we're going to pay to the IRS. Um, I asked careful what I'm allowed to say or not say, but I'll just say it in public. This kind of thing, A, the, the correction plan should, have, in my opinion, be in the management letter from our auditor. Um, there should be some acknowledgement in the audit that this happened, that, we, that this corrective action was taken. Um, I wonder about whether there's any liability on the part of our, either one of our auditors or Blue Cross and Blue Shield, because all these all these things were done for years and, and the practice, you know, we've hired professionals to look out for us and make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen. And there's nothing in the management report that looks ahead and say, I've looked at similar practices. For instance, take the custodian engineers. Um, there, the IRS has taken a position that the money that we pay the custodial engineers that then goes out the parties is without documentation of expenses income. That's their position, correct? Well, what are we going to do about that going forward? And what are we going to do if the, the uh, union resists and doesn't do it? So none of that's identified here in the audit. Uh, so I just find it deficient, and I know I raised this before. And even though I raised it, I think the board <coughs> members had an issue. There was nothing amended in the audit to reflect those issues. Yeah, I mean those are operational <laughs> issues, um, and I don't know how much we I can say. I would maybe. Well, I would, I would think you know the fact that we've resolved the audit, you know, is certainly public information on what the IRS has determined. You know, it is, it is, for all intents and purposes, public information. How we deal with that, especially as it relates to the engineers and cosmetic, I would suggest be discussed in the next session. Yes, those are issues. And I'm okay with that, but there's no even a, there's no even reference to it to the audit, so. If the New York State Auditor, the City Auditor, came in and said, "Hey, I want to know what happened," you wouldn't even see it mentioned in our audit. Well, it's disclosed in there. Where? In the MDNA. I didn't see it in the management letter. No, it's in our. It's in our report. Management oh, report. Your report. To yeah, but, no. And that's really. I mean, ultimately, the, the reports are <coughs> ours. It's our financial statement. It's, no, our, it's our financial, financial statement, but but we hire professionals to look over our shoulders advise us to identify areas where they're concerned, that's what an audit would do, and to give us direction so we can take track of that. This issue with the custodian engineers has been raised in one form or another by many people over many years, but it was an issue that <coughs> came to a head in New York City, I believe, a year ago. This should not have been unknown, certainly not for our office. Well, Larry, I think the question that the auditor pointed out to us is there's management audits, auditors, cost accountant auditors. There's, you know, there's various auditors. And she said very simply that she's not our cost accountant, she's not our management accountant. Management is responsible for coming up with corrective action <coughs> or expand yeah. the scope of what we asked the auditor to do. She's a financial auditor. Expand her scope and say, we want you to address and make recommendations to management for these areas. And you pay extra no. to get it done. So no, we no, have no. we have to do no, that. No, no. Okay. This is an independent audit. And they are there to advise you as the practices that you're engaged in that would either create a liability or improper accounting procedures or bad cash management, all those issues, correct? There's 
things that may come up them in our internal auditor. And, and if they don't tell you about them, and then it hits you in the head, private sector, they, you sue them. There are a lot of big eight accounting firms that aren't big eight accounting firms anymore because of the old uh, the, the period we went through with Enron where there was all kinds of, and all kinds of bad accounting practice and they all got sued and a lot of them went out of business because they didn't advise on an independent basis things that were going on. All I'm, so I, I strongly disagree with it. It's the job. We're, we're, there's, not a, there's not a certified public accountant on this board. Uh, the, the auditor's not going to tell you they made mistakes. Well, I'm sure they're not, but I'm but I'm out to point out, and and it is also it, it, we're in a u unique thing. I've pointed this out to you before. In most corporate structures, CFO has a, a dual report to the CEO and the board. We do not have that here, so we rely on an independent auditor even more so. So I am raising this issue. I'm I'm objecting to the way it's written. I'm done. And I understand we have a management oh. letter which gave the scope of the audit, and she clearly expressed the in her report I what she did. that she, that <laughs> the issue had been resolved. Maybe last year somebody should have raised the issue. Well, it was but the same she person. said it has been resolved, and that it's without outside of the scope, and that we have every opportunity to expand the scope. And it's spelled out when auditors make engagements. It's spelled out in the management letter of what they're supposed to do. Uh, Jeff, do we have an external and an internal auditor? We have an internal audit. Or they're actually external, but we have an internal auditor. And actually, after our discussion last week, mm -hmm. I did tell them that this was an area that I want them to look at. I, I believe that the internal audit is a little, it's, that's, that is the type of focus that should be on sort of the operational issues and things like that. So I, I'm addressing with that when I meet with them next. What is Freed Medzik, our internal? They, they are external. the financial statement auditor. So if I report to you that we have cash in the bank on the financials, mm -hmm. if you look at the balance sheet income statement, they're auditing to make sure that those amounts that we report are, are proper and true. So they, they confirm cash balances. They make sure that if we have a receivable from the state that we actually collect that. Um, they'll look at our fund balance. So they, they look at the transactions that we record during the year, good, bad, or ugly, in terms of how we report them and how that gets consolidated into our financial statements. And then they opine on, is that a true representation of everything? We'll take a look at the scope of work and come back and advise them in an executive session on where a lot of the lies have been as it relates to anybody that was connected with anything that happened. Thanks. It includes Russia. Does the city city controller have any responsibility? Because for the county, we have an independent controller who's always reviewing everything and working with our external auditor. So I don't know. Does the city controller have any responsibility since we are Buffalo schools? Working with the city, we're audited by the by the city comptroller. Uh, we have there's probably ten or twelve different entities that, that audit us for various things at various and times. And he raised the they raised no flags to any. That was not raised by by, by any auditor. Okay, I'd like to just if we're through with this discussion, I'd like for the board to just take a look at eight items: eighteen F, G, H, and I. This is us with Harker, Sequest, and Emory. And we are upwards now to $40,000. And um, I'm, I'm very concerned that um, if we don't put or have a discussion about putting a cap on how much we're willing to spend, that we're going to continue to have things run up. This is uh, the attorney that is representing um, the school district in regards to the LP Seminelli incident or uh, the joint school construction issue and today they're submitting $38,000 worth of bills. Um, personally, I would like for them uh, to come back and tell us what they've done and, and how they're moving forward because I really think this is going to be something we're going to have to cap uh, in the near future. Yeah, they were, they were here in August and I know provided the board with an update. Uh, the appeal before the appellate division is being heard next week. Okay. Um, and there are some further developments that are happening that you were updated on in relation to the 
consideration of what's happening here at the State Supreme Court before the other judge on some other outstanding matters. Um, and I know there's a, I think a hearing within the next couple of weeks on those issues. Um, there have been developments, and I will bring John Horn back uh, next month to provide the board with an update on where things stand Good. as of next month. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Does anyone have any um, additional questions? Where is Mr. Quinn? Hold this the restroom. Oh, okay. Um, does he not want to vote? Or he can have the Not optional. He can probably yell. <laughs> oh, there was one. Okay. Um, one thing got pulled. One's uh, pulled and the other one's tabled, right? Oh, no. 16B got pulled. But then these two policies, right, one's well, removed from the table and the other one's to be tabled? Yeah. The exception list on the last page? The electronic communications and the... Uh, oh, I know you want to speak on the board um, adding another session. <laughs> it's said to be tabled. Unless you have comments on the way, unless you have comments on the way, yeah, but you can comment this evening on the way that the policy is written. I would suggest you take a look at that and if you do have uh, questions or issues in the way that it was written, let me know about that today or before the next board meeting so the adjustments can be made. Now would be the appropriate. Can we pull up the B? Can do. Yeah, it, it appears. Oh, the cell phone one first. First and second. It's remote. Twenty two B. I have board work sessions. Wednesdays will be work sessions. So right, it's incorrect. Board meeting will always be a third. Uh, I'm looking here. Is that yeah, yeah. And the reason I, the reason it was put that way because the feedback from the committee was that you wanted to have the work sessions before the board meeting. Wow. We have nothing for twenty three. Yeah, there it is, right there, twenty. Too. Did, did, did you hear what um, <laughs> Mr. Kuzman said? I'm sorry, no. No, I said, uh, uh, Board Member Woods had a question about that I had. The, it was, the way it was written was the first and the second Wednesday would be the work sessions, with the third being the board meeting. I said the way that I, the reason I wrote it that way was because the feedback I received from the board at the work session last week was that you wanted to have the work sessions prior to the board meeting. Yes. Um, so it doesn't make sense to have. Did we open okay, the one so for the board session? So we are voting on uh, the electronic communication device today. That one is being voted on. It's not removed from the table. It's at its uh, voting on it. Do you want to see the work session one? I did, but which one did you want to see? The board work session. Twenty-two B. Twenty-three B. If we reference in it um, the language yeah. that you know is the correct the policy, that, see, that, all of that. Yeah. If it's successful, we have to correct the policy. That's what I've done. I've amended the policy. Um, that, that's the policy for work sessions okay. that the board adopted last December. Yep. So everything that's underlined. Mm. Okay. Oh, thank you. And ideally, in the past, we have alternated um, which one would go to first and which one would go to second. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I put in there that the board deserves the right to change the order. So if that's what you, the board desires to do, you can do that. Um. <coughs> <coughs> The, the time you know, so we're the first one from the second in that evening. We'll start at five and start at seven, you know, so we have to the two. Yeah. Uh, to the public, um, the, um, the conversation in regards to this board work session is that originally our, um, the board had uh, voted to reduce the amount of meetings and work sessions. Now it has been determined that an additional work session is necessary for the board to do its job. Uh, and do it in a, in a, in a, in a good way. Um, we are over close to a billion dollars and in my opinion nothing should come before the board that has not gone before that, at a work session. So I'm glad to hear that we're having that discussion. I think the public expects for us to do our due diligence yes. in regards to making these decisions and voting and that's why that, that's on there. Um, if, you know, you know, that's my concern. So we are, we're going to um so it's tabled table. today and we mm -hmm. vote in november right. and if it passes it would be effective in december mm -hmm. Good. Right. okay
And then what about this one, the electronic one? Anybody needs to see that one? This is being voted, voted on today. On today. Correct. Okay. Now, the reason for the, um, to the public, the reason for the um, vote in regards to the use of electronic communication devices at the board table is that we have received complaints over the years as well as when speakers are speaking that board members are using their uh, tablets, their uh, cell phones and not paying attention. And since we only have one meeting a month, uh, the board uh, feels that we should be focused in on the meeting and not uh, dealing with uh, communication issues, communication devices. Yes, Mark. I just wanted to say, and I'm just raising it as a about <laughs> with three board members not here, and this impacts every board member. Is it possible to hold it over until November? Mm -hmm. What if it ends up in a tie? We need five to have it passed. We need five to have it passed. No. And, and basically, what a third of the board? Is it one third? Yeah, there's a third of the board that's not here. <laughs> but it's power. Correct me if I'm wrong, General Council. It's policy, though. The, the process is outlined in policy our policy either gets adopted or amended, right? Okay. So in order to change that policy the way it flows, I think you have to have a majority of the board vote to change. You correct? To, have, you to can't change or adopt the policy. Right. You can't approve anything without five. So it won't be approved votes. anyway. If it doesn't have five votes, it won't be approved anyway. I, was I got about, that, but because we have a third of the board meeting. Well, you need five votes for that too, right? That's what I, that's what I was, I was going oh, for the first part. I'm sorry. Uh, that's good. I'm sorry. So you can make a motion to move it to the next meeting. I'll make a motion that we move the vote for the, for the next meeting. I'll second it. Need to take Because we have, I should say, because we have one third of our members. Roll, please roll call, please. Mrs. Bellman Collins? Yes. Dr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Jay? No. Ms. Pierce? No. No. Ms. Woods? Yes. Uh, motion fails. Okay. okay. So it has to get brought up again? Yeah. Why? No, we got a vote. Yes. Just vote on it. Okay, so if there's a tie, how does that work? It fails, right? I've asked for um I've asked for uh, yeah, a legal ruling on you the only one with the weapon. I can shoot out. I've asked for a ruling uh, from right. legal in regards to a tied vote, how does it work according to Robert Rules of Order? Because in the past, or how Robert Rules of Order reads, is that uh, you are able to bring something back if you are in the majority. And if you have a tie, how is that determined as far as the majority? I will go on record to say that if this does not pass, what you're saying to your constituents is, is that you're not important enough for me to focus in for one hour, for, for three hours, four hours of one one day a month one board meeting a month and it's not acceptable to really sit at this board and be ornamental it really isn't it's a lot of work to be done in this district and i think that we need to start expecting more as a board and one thing we should expect is for you not to sit there texting people while you're in, at this board table we need to be we need to understand that people are looking at that and i think you owe it to your constituents for that you're not, your, your lives are not more important than anyone here that you can't stop it. And I, I really have a problem with this board transacting business and the things that I see going on with the phone. I really have a major issue. I really do. I really think it's so a maturity. So you're, you're consulting mm -hmm. with the attorney about the tie for the motion. And what I'm was the result? He's working on it. Because oh, okay. mm -hmm. I'm going to use it. 
the, yeah. the, the issue, as I understand, it, is if it can be brought back to the table, when it can be brought back to the table. Right. You can decide that another night. Another night. Mm -hmm. No, if the term is on the vote. Um, Nate, if, if this policy doesn't pass, that doesn't prevent this board from instituting guidelines like you suggested it earlier, correct? That, that is correct. Thank you. Uh, and, and what format? It's not. I don't know if that's true, Nate. In what format would the guidelines take if it's not a policy? Uh, the, the chair would set a set of guidelines at the beginning of each meeting, reminding each board member to shut their cell phones off, reminding the board to put their in be sufficient. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Well, maybe we operate that and way. And I do recall that you had um, had some uh, examples from other boards or things that you had researched that you were going to provide the board with as far as guidance, correct? Yeah, I did. Yeah, for this group yeah, of adults yeah, yeah, yeah. sitting here. Yeah. I did provide that. Yeah. Okay. As to Nate's legal opinion, I mean, it's right. not going to affect anything. Can he, he can communicate to us whether he can bring it back or not. Uh, nobody's bringing it back tonight. So why belabor it tonight? And, and I want to say, if I may, Chair, that um, it's not about being an adult or not. There are many places, official places, where cell phone use is not allowed. Oh, not appropriate. You can be 13, <laughs> or you can be 30, or you can be 90. It's not allowed. And so, as adults, if you want to speak about adults, we all should be used to that. This is the public's meeting. Not mine, not yours, it's a public's meeting, and we should give them our undivided attention. We are talking about children's lives. Hmm. Well, my point was that the complaints came from the public. And they came from the, <laughs> the public. The actual complaints for this, according to... Thank God they didn't come and call people out. It, people, they you know, that watching the complaints they do, they do, they do, to their do, representatives. Do that and that's why they asked for that, that policy. Yes, ma'am. Well, I just want to say that sometimes while I'm sitting here and reading, I actually get text messages from the public. And, and I, I mean, well, I it's, it's the way the world operates now. They're not here. They're not sitting in the audience. They may want to you know, voice an opinion or say something. I'm, I, I listen to that. You should, and that's great, but it doesn't, you don't do it during the meeting. Well, so. sure, my phone's always Ms. right here. Of course I do. Never. Everybody at this table has used their cell phone at one point in time. I've watched every single one of you. But it's not answer a text. But it's yes. It's not. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Text, every single person here has done So what does that have to do it. with moving forward? It doesn't. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. So, okay. What so you, take what a vote. What is your thing? Uh, so so let's take a vote. I don't so care. Well, excuse me. I've asked well, for a ruling. Simple. I think the, as I said, the issue is a motion to reconsider. Mm -hmm. The item does not pass. It must be made. Well, I didn't ask the mo I didn't make the motion because it might fail. I made the motion because one third of our board is absent, and most of them are on board kinds of business. <laughs> They're attending conferences and things. It's just really unjust. Well, I would say that if a lot of things no, you're pertaining to them as an Your motion was to move it to the next meeting. Yeah, that's the next right. question okay. is, is now right. this, this policy is going to be up right. for a vote tonight. If that doesn't pass, we'll be brought back up. Oh, okay. Okay. What do we got to do? <laughs> what do we do? Are well, we let's, let's take, we've got the consent agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Should we do a roll call on the consent agenda? Yes. I would like a reverse. Okay. I'm on the consent reverse. agenda. 16B has been pulled. I think every other. Yes, 16B member. has been pulled. Thank you, Mr. Kuzma. 23B is. Is table. Well, it's 22B on here. Can you go back to the agenda? Oh, that's 22B. That's 22B. So this has been tabled. 22A will be voted on. 22A will be voted on. 22A is what? The cell phone. Cell phone. Can you just go back to the agenda part? 22B, this will be tabled. Right. Right, so 22A. Mm -hmm. 
Miss Woods, how do you vote on the consent agenda? That's <laughs> scary. <laughs> What happened to so 16 B was 16 or 16 C? That's my approach. Section 16 C. Yes. And D. The uh, electrical contracts. I think they should be rebuilt. Mr. Flynn. Uh, I accept 16 C, 16 B. Um, I'm looking for. Uh, 21A and uh, resolutions 20, 22A is the one that's 22A. 22A and I'm recusing myself on 718E. Section 16C and D, 21A, 22A, and recuse on what was that? Uh, Goldberg's 16, 16E. What? 18E. 18E, I'm sorry, 18E. Ms. Pierce, how do you vote? I am voting to accept 16C and D, and I vote no on 22A. agenda passes with the exception of 22A and no. 16, oh, okay. 16C and D. The mm -hmm. remainder passes. Break up those. Okay. All right, let's see where we are. We need to go into executive session and have a um can we take a break? Yeah, can we have a before we get up, can we have a motion to go into executive take a recess for five minutes and go into executive session? Oh, the reason you said the purpose. Wait, wait one minute, Ms. 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 Jack. May I have a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing the potential discipline of a specific district employees, for the purpose of discussing an issue regarding protected student information, and for the purpose of receiving legal advice? Some of. Okay. All right. So moved. Okay. I can't read these. So on the we need this second work session. Too much information, we're not getting it all. We should have been given the IRS actual document. We can read. So we're we gonna sue somebody. Okay, can we, can we talk? Can we get back to things? Okay, the board has reconvened after executive session and no action was taken regarding the discipline of certain district employees. What you gave me to no, say? There no, was one, the wrong there was okay. action. Reverse that, start that thing over. <laughs> and action, and action, action was, was taken. taken. Okay. Oh. There's no no in there. You read no in I'm tired. Um, Could you do it over, Mike? Start it all over? Oh, it's a good time? Okay. The board has reconvened after executive session and action was taken regarding the discipline of certain district employees. May I have a motion authorizing the superintendent to, pre to prefer section 75 disciplinary charges against employee K. 
motion. Okay. First and second, you got it. Mr. Quinn was first. Somebody over here was second. Doctor. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, 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 oh, you're okay. <laughs> oh, hope it's over there in the corner. Okay. Any oppositions? Okay, thank you. Ice so pass. May I have, yeah. may I have a motion authorizing an expenditure in the amount of 17500 to settle case number 14-CV-762 WMS? Okay. Larry. All was, in favor? That was Mr. Quinn. Aye. Ms. Woods seconded. All in favor? Aye. There we go. Any opposition? Yes. Sharon Cotman. Come on, give it a mic. Oh, motion to adjourn. Okay. Yep. Motion to oh, adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Good job, guys. Thank you.